All right, we should be recording. Uh, so um, welcome to the July 15th joint meeting of the City of Boulder Planning Board and the Transportation Advisory Board. It's so nice to be together again. Um, I'm Dave Ensign. I'll be uh, just doing the few little tasks of chairing. Uh, Tila and I exchanged an email on that. And uh, since I made the agenda setting meeting, we figured that would work. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it over then to Jean Gatza to do the uh, uh, virtual uh, participation uh, rules. Jean? Great. Um, thank you, David. So the city is engaged with the community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This promotes safety for our community members, staff, council, and boards, um, as well as the democracy for, the, for um, people of all walks of life. Um, more about this vision and the full rules can be found on the city council webpage under, um, under participate in city council meetings. Okay, let me move to the next one. All right, are you seeing my next slide? Yeah, there we go. Um, the following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code, and these will be upheld during this meeting. So all remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person, any obscenity, dehumanizing language, racial, racial epithets, or other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. And um, participants are required to post, um, uh, uh, actually it's just their, the name that they're currently um, known by. And we typically require a full name before public comment. Um, still not seeing members of the community, but if we get any in the next few minutes before open comment, um, we will use the raise hand function to do that. And I can go over um, a little more protocol at that point, should we have folks. I think that's all That's all of I have, David. Great, thank you so much, Jean. And um, I just wanted to just, uh, um, if everybody would indulge me for a moment, we have a very big uh, update next week on CU South. Uh, and uh, I've been asked to just remind the public for, I guess there isn't any public here, but if anyone listens later, uh, that we have a 48 hour, hour cutoff for any uh, communications electronically that will be considered as part of public record for that hearing. So please remember to get comments in 48 hours before the meeting, that will be 6 p.m. on Tuesday, if you have anything to submit in writing or if you have any presentations. And otherwise the speaking engagements, of course, go up until meeting time. So, uh, so I just wanted to make sure to highlight that so there's no surprises for folks next week for that uh, fairly big item. And so now before we go into public participation, I'll just turn it over to um, um, our planning director, Jacob Lindsay, to welcome us. Thank you, Jacob, for attending. Thank you, David, and welcome to all of our members of Planning Board as well as Transportation Advisory Board. I just wanted to, um, first of all, give a word of thanks from all of city staff to each of you who give so much to the city of Boulder, volunteering your time, effort, and, uh, and, and insights to the work that we do. Tonight, you'll be hearing from staff an update on the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan. And more importantly, we'll be listening to you to hear the feedback that you have, the insights that you have, and the important dialogue that comes from having these two boards convene as one. Um, I think that this is a special meeting for us, and it also marks a milestone in the course of this plan as we are really crossing the 50% mark and reaching a point where this plan is beginning to have recommendations that coalesce into something greater than what it was before. Um, this part of Boulder, of course, is a unique place. It's a place that's in transition, and this subcommunity plan comes at just the right time to guide the growth of this place. Um, efforts like this and meetings like this are part of what makes Boulder the number one city to live in America, according to some sources, and it's because of your effort that we've achieved that kind of milestone. So thank you all for being here. And thank you all for the, um, the robust showing of city staff that I see as well. And uh, with that, I will um, turn it over and we can continue on this meeting. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, and uh, great. So um, the, the next item on the agenda then would be for public participation. Um, Jean, do we have anyone on to participate in the public participation at this point? Um, not unless anybody who's here for the next item um, 
as a panelist would like to address the board on some other topic um, or this topic as open comment. But, um, oh, here we go. Looks like we've got um, one other attendee. Um, Kurt, we've just, I see that you've just joined us. We've just um, opened up the um, open comment and are asking if folks would like to speak. Would you like to, if you would like to address the board, you can use the raise hand function. And uh, the public speakers will have three minutes to address the board and you can address us on any subject, including East Boulder subcommittee plan. So we'll look to see if Kurt is gonna raise his hand. Kurt, we're, and since you just joined us, um, you are the only member of the community um, and that's why we were naming you specifically, so. All right, well, it looks like then we're probably good to go to move forward if we don't see the hand raise. Thank you, Jean, for that. Okay, so we have uh, one discussion item tonight, uh, and that is uh, East Boulder Subcommunity Plan Joint Board Work Session to provide feedback on the community review draft of the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan. And uh, so we'll be hearing from a number of staff members and consultants uh, tonight. And uh, so it's gonna be quite a, uh, an extensive presentation, I think. So I think tonight what we'll do is go ahead and hear the presentations because then we'll hear all of the related uh, uh, concepts put before us and then do open it up for questions after the presentations because uh, there might be things in the slides that answer some previous things. So just keep your, hold your questions tonight. Uh, and then we're gonna try to keep it to about 20 to 30 minutes for, for questions. And then we'll go into four key um, for questions for the presenters, that is. And then we'll go into four key quest issues that have been, we've been asked to comment on. And those four issues were put in our packet and we'll go through them one at a time. And then what we're gonna do is, Gene will kind of run us through calling on each individual board member to speak for you know, a minute or two on each of those key issues. Uh, since we have so many people involved, we thought that would be a good way to go forward. And Jean, you can fill me in if I missed anything on that, since I know you kind of came up with that proposed uh, way to do things. Does that make sense? That, that's great. Well, um, once we get to the discussion times, we'll, um, we'll show you our fun uh, way of starting off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to start with a random person and then go by uh, alphabetical order by name, so that way people can just kind of not worry about whether they go first until they get called on. So um, with that, then I'll go ahead and turn it over. Um, Charles, did you want to kick us off uh, on behalf of the planning department? And we'll look forward to the presentations. Um, you know, I don't have any remarks this evening, so we can go ahead and just turn it right over to Kathleen to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, go ahead and take it away. OK. Um, I'm going to share my screen and pull up the presentation. Kathleen, do you want to introduce the other staff that are and consultants that are here too? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have staff from both planning and transportation. So um, folks that will be speaking tonight include myself, Jean Gatza, uh, Jean Sanson, um, uh, I know Erica from transportation or transportation director is also here as well as Chris Haglin. Um, I saw Natalie was here. Um, and then Holly, who is also on our staff team. And then um, we're gonna be joined by um, our consultants on the 55th and Arapaho station area plan. So that includes um, Mark De La Torre and Jay Renkins from MIG as well as a, a couple other folks who make up that consultant team. And I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves when, when um, we get going. But um, I'm super excited for tonight. I, I'm, I'm really um, grateful to have these two groups back together. Um, we've made a lot of progress since we met in April. And so um, looking forward to sharing all of this work with you and um, you know, get your thoughts about our engagement strategy for the upcoming window in the fall. So let's see. Um, it, David just kind of ran through this, but you know there was a ton of new material in your packets, and we're going to try to break that down for you 
and go through a couple key pieces tonight before we dive into the discussion. City staff is gonna first present some of the key features of the draft plan, and then we will be joined by that consultant team who's been working on a key site, 55th and Arapahoe Station area. Um, as David mentioned, I'm sure there's gonna be questions, so we re reserve time for that. And then um, we'd like to break into discussion and collect your feedback about key features of the draft. We'll do another quick presentation to talk about strategy for engagement, and then hope to hear from you on the kind of input you would want to hear um, from the community in order to support the plan as we work our, work our way towards completing the project. So as I mentioned, big topics for tonight are the draft and our engagement strategy. I wanted to give you um, an overall picture of where we're at in the planning process. The work that we're gonna be reviewing tonight is the result of two years of working with the community to learn about East Boulder, generate ideas about how it might change in the future, and weigh trade-offs about priorities for the sub-community. So we believe that, you know, we're really at a milestone in the project where we're close to the finish line on the vision for East Boulder and how that manifests in a land use and connections plan. So we've started thinking about implementation and how to make that vision a reality over time. So we're here to confirm that the land use and connections recommendations have your support to move towards implementation planning. And we'll be taking your feedback along with the East Boulder Working Group's input to council in two weeks. We'll make any recommended refinements over the remaining weeks of the summer and then plan to launch this engagement window after Labor Day. After the engagement window closes, we're gonna evaluate the feedback we hear from the community to solidify recommendations um, staff will be working across city de departments to negotiate options for implementation and then bring a final draft of the plan back to boards towards the end of the year, looking for TAB's recommendation and planning board's adoption. So we're hoping to wrap the project and seek adoption from council in early 2022. Um, with that in mind, you know, the key questions for tonight are, do you support the land use plan, the connections plan, the concept for 55th and Arapahoe station area? Um, and if the answer is no to any of these, what are the key refinements or changes that need to be made prior to these key features of the draft going to the community in September? Okay, so <laughs> let's get into it. I'm gonna um, walk, through, walk through those key features of the plan. Um, the thing to keep in mind as I go through the material and as we talk about engagement is that this phase of the project is really the last major opportunity for community members to continue to help shape the outcomes of the plan and weigh in on recommendations for the future. So that's really, um, that's why we call it the community review draft. Those key features I keep mentioning are the um, vision, land use and connections plan. So we're gonna start with the vision and uh, over the past two years, We've learned a lot about the people and places that make up the East Boulder subcommunity. And I think um, part of what we found is that the subcommunity is a little misunderstood by people who may not be regulars to the area. I think most people know that it's a job center in the city. There are over 800 businesses in the area and very little housing. So almost everyone working in East Boulder commutes. Um, but beyond those great local businesses and the workforce that's so important to our local economy, there's a myriad of other amazing assets, um, parks and creeks and greenways, tight knit residential community at San Lazaro, um, funky places to buy a banjo or learn how to paint. And so those are the assets that the plan is really built on. Our mission has been to evaluate East Boulder and find ways to implement these six focus areas of the comp plan into the sub community. And that came with a lot of discussion and weighing the trade-offs to be realistic about what is achievable in this part of the city. And uh, you know, I think we're landing in a great place. The recommended vision for the subcommunity is that area neighborhoods will evolve to make the East Boulder subcommunity thrive as an innovative working industrial subcommunity of Boulder where all community members have access and options for living, working, and playing. And, you know, I think um, this is a big challenge. This is not a small idea. The vision describes a place that maintains its industrial nature, but welcomes new uses. Um, the most significant of those being residential. And, you know, this really hasn't been accomplished successfully in many places in the United States. 
I think our team and the community is very cognizant of the history of gentrification of industrial neighborhoods in cities across the country. And so, you know, we've really studied the successes and failures of those places and have developed a land use and connection strategy that is designed to be strategic about change, but flexible enough to take advantage of opportunities if they arise. So here's the land use plan. Um, we reviewed a version of this back when we met in April and boards gave uh, great feedback that helped us make some key updates like extending the reach of a mixed use industrial land use to 55th street corridor and reserving land adjacent to KOA Lake for community industrial uses. The plan includes changes to existing land use and those areas are outlined in yellow, um, redefining what some of those land uses mean, adding a new land use designation and pursuing the annexation of important areas to help create more cohesive neighborhoods. So what are the major changes? Um, this graphic compares the amount of land designated to each kind of land use in the BVCP land use map. Those are in blue um, to the recommended land uses, which are in orange. You can see you know, that the most obvious shift is the redesignation of light industrial land to mixed use designations. So we're gonna take a look at those. Um, the BV BVCP land use map includes a designation called mixed use industrial. However, the definition of this um, is relatively vague and it leaves um, some considerations about key characteristics to other guiding tools. Using the community feedback we've received about how mixed use industrial neighborhoods should look and perform in Boulder, um, we're including a revised definition for this land use in the draft plan. We're also adding a new land use designation that will help guide redevelopment in the 55th and Arapahoe station area. This recommendation is also meant to provide guidance for other areas of the city into the future as we continue to plan for transit oriented neighborhoods and shifting travel behaviors across the city. So the, that's the um, kind of main components of the land use map, but I'd like to spend a little time describing how those changes along with other recommendations are moving East Boulder closer towards achieving a vision for the area. Um, so first design quality and placemaking on the screen is the vision statement for this focus area. Um, this was probably one of the most hotly debated focus areas because it's, um, you know, it's mostly about aesthetics and everyone has their own preferences and tastes for, for what they think is beautiful or appropriate or memorable. Um, so what we're attempting in the subcommunity plan recommendations is to remove some of the more subjective characteristics of places and focus on form and performance of space so that we can generate the types of places that people will love um, but allow for that experimentation and unconventional personality to come through our very creative uh, design community. We worked with the East Boulder Working Group to collect images of buildings, neighborhoods, and public spaces and listen to find, find out what they loved about these images and how they might see these types of places come to life in East Boulder. This helped us generate a tool in the East Boulder subcommunity plan called Place Types. Place types provide an additional layer of information and guidance for the land use plan and help set expectations about the characteristics and performance of redevelopment in different areas of the subcommunity. As we move forward towards plan completion, the place types map and descriptions will guide key implementation steps for potential code updates, rezonings, the potential creation of new zones, or considerations about the creation and application of a form based code in East Boulder. So um, you'll notice that the place types um, performance standards combine expectations about things that are generally more land use oriented like density and FAR ranges with those that are more transportation oriented like access and mobility. We're hoping that this planning effort helps us continue to move our practices forward considering how environments inside and outside the right of way support and complement each other in places we all experience every day. The next major focus area is housing affordability and diversity. We used our place types performance and mapping to help evaluate the types of housing that could be located throughout the subcommunity and how much new housing could potentially be added by changes resulting from this plan. Realistically, based on the land uses and place types, the team generated 
we could expect East Boulder to contribute between 2,600 and 4,400 new homes to the city's housing stock. That range is, um, it's entirely dependent on private redevelopment uh, using the 25% requirement of new residential development allocated for affordable housing. This could contribute between 580 and 1,100 new per permanently affordable units um, should they be built on site. And then you'll remember last fall, uh, we presented three different land use scenarios to boards and the community for evaluation and feedback. So comparing our recommended uh, land use plan with those scenarios, I think we've landed at a, a pretty healthy balance between, between the three. Um, a major reason for this is our strategic approach to identifying key neighborhoods where residential density could be well integrated into some of these business oriented places and also help create 15 minute neighborhoods. And that, that 15 minute neighborhood strategy is a key component to our efforts for supporting local businesses in East Boulder. Being able to build a great network of business, workforce, and customer in East Boulder will help the area thrive and businesses grow. Additionally, the land use plan does maintain a significant amount of land that will be prioritized for industrial use. We made no changes to the general industrial land in East Boulder, so we will still have a place for those heavier manufacturing sites and businesses in the subcommunity. We slightly increased the amount of community industrial land in the subcommunity by identifying key areas where small businesses and small business space can operate freely, but still have great access for transporting goods. While the land use recommendations do change other areas of the subcommunity from, excuse me, light industrial use to a mixed use industrial category, the intention is to bring greater access and allow for more density in these areas so that we can safely integrate re residential into industrial neighborhoods in a way that supports a solid network of residents, businesses, and work for, workforce so they all experience success together. For resilience and climate commitment, a big piece of the plan's contribution is tied to um, our mobility strategy and connections plan. So um, Jean Sanson will talk through, through that shortly. But there are a number of other great ideas that have come from the community that we're looking for ways to implement as well. A pretty significant one um, being a contribution to the city's urban forest. We'll be working with our urban forestry team to reevaluate priority planting sites to increase the subcommunity's canopy from where it's at today, which is less than 5%, to the city's goal of over 16%, helping us manage a variety of climate impacts, including stormwater management, carbon sequestration, air quality, and energy use. There are also a number of potential capital projects as well as opportunities for public-private partnerships that have been identified as potential recommendations of the plan. One such idea that the group is um, maybe familiar with um, is some of the initial concept work surrounding potential future of the Belmont power plant site. And then um, community members and city staff have also identified uh, a wide variety of opportunities for the city to make greater contribution to our arts and cultural community in East Boulder. Some of these ideas include community cultural space as part of the programming for future renovations at the Municipal Services Center and landmark designation of the old mill site at Belmont View. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague in transportation, Jean Sanson, and talk about how the subcommunity plan will make contributions to our access and mobility goals, and she will walk through recommendations of the connections plan. Thank you, Kathleen. So in regard to access and mobility, um, you know, the point of creating access and mobility connections and improvements to safety and comfort in the area is really to think about how transportation can work to support redevelopment and changes in East Arapahoe as it evolves over the next 10, 20 years. So that transportation is not necessarily an end in itself, but it's a way to ensure that we're considering all people, regardless of how they travel, and doing it in a way that supports the community values, many of which um, Kathleen just walked through. And so as we know, much of East Boulder grew up around the car, the automobiles, trucks and vehicles and such. And so as we think about changing land uses in the area, we need to think about how to better accommodate and more safely accommodate different travel modes. And so as you'll see, as we walk through some of these slides, there's some big moves. Kathleen, if you can go to the next slide. 
Um, there's some new connections. And then there's system enhancements. What sorts of things can we be looking at in addition to what's already in our transportation master plan to support some of the recommendations um, that are coming out of the larger East Boulder subcommunity plan? So in regard to the big moves, um, here we go. So I don't think many of these um, should be new to you all. I think you've seen them in one form or fashion, but we're all aware that East Arapahoe State Highway 7 is our major east-west regional connection to I-25 and beyond. And East Arapahoe is the west end of a much larger segment where we're looking to develop in partnership with our communities to the east, a complete street that's going to include high frequency, high quality bus rapid transit. It's going to include a commuter bikeway and other features that are going to help people to safely navigate East Arapahoe with better travel options, both through the corridor, because we know it's a commuter corridor, and also within East Arapahoe and the community itself. So that's one of our big moves. The next one is related to the hop. So we've had um, plans in the works for quite a while to extend and our urban circulator, the hop transit service that currently circulates through much of our community out east to the Flatiron Business Park and to 55th and Arapahoe. We're currently looking at the best way to design that service. It could look like a fixed route service. It could look like more of a um, transit on demand service, but that is a big move to, pro to provide that transit, that high frequency transit service that's currently lacking in much of this area today. Micro mobility is our third big move and a very exciting one as we move into the world of incorporating um, dockless e-bikes and e-scooters into the area. There's a lot of excitement around this area. And frankly, it's one of the best ways to solve that first and final mile problem to provide an easy connection to people to get from say, let's just say the Flatiron Business Park to Ozo. That can feel like a pretty uncomfortable walk, but might feel like a really comfortable e-bike or e-scooter ride. Curbside management is another big move. The idea there being that, you know, there's a lot of demand for curb space in our community and particularly in East Boulder, as we think about just the volume of freight and goods movement that moves through this area. So it's um, incumbent upon us to look at this area in a very focused way to ensure that as the city establishes policies for curbside management, we're doing it in such a way that accommodates freight movement, um, Uber, Lyft, pick up and drop off and other uses of our curbside space in a way that's efficient. Um, and then related to this the bit, last big move would be the 55th Street Mobility Hub. And you're gonna be hearing more about this as our consultants speak to the station area master plan. But we really see 55th and Arapahoe being that anchor for mobility to the rest of the East Boulder subcommunity plan connected with satellite hubs so that you could, for example, get off the bus rapid transit, get on an e-scooter, take that to another location, and then hop on a high-frequency local transit service. So again, the idea is to start to connect these transportation options in centralized locations. So moving on, Kathleen, thank you. Um, so I won't go through this in much detail, but you know, a comp key component of the subcommunity plan is to develop new connections. Um, as much of you know, they're very long blocks um, through much of the subcommunity, hard to navigate. And the idea is to create a more fine grade network of connections to move people comfortably through these areas. So you'll notice there are several new connections proposed to be able to support the redevelopment and changes that we're looking at that we just previously looked at um, in Kathleen's land use recommendations. And system enhancements speak to um, the types of system enhancements that we would like to see, whether they're um, part of the transportation master plan or should, should be considered as part of transportation master plan updates. Um, you know, this is sort of a grab bag of recommended system enhancements. And I will say that you're looking at a work in progress. It's staff and staff's intention to likely not necessarily pinpoint specific geographic locations for some of these enhancements, but to speak more broadly, for example, to where we would like to see street upgrades. So for example, you'll notice that there are several um, you know, indications along 55th Street. The idea here being that we are, um, we're reflecting what we've heard from the community in terms of the need to enhance the comfort of bicyclists, pedestrians, and vehicle movement along 55th Street, and are respecting what we have adopted as part of our transportation master plan 
to do a corridor assessment of how that street might be upgraded in the future. So there's an example of a system enhancement. Other types of enhancements might be more low hanging fruit and things that we can actually start to implement in the coming weeks or months. For example, putting some signage into the multi-use path network adding some of the um, missing sidewalk links that um, our community members have pointed out to us to our list of improvements that need to be made. So we're going to be working through the system enhancements um, a little bit more, but it would be nice to get some feedback as we move into the conversation piece of tonight's agenda. Thanks, Jean. Thank um, you. So, you know, how do all of these pieces come together? What could this evolution of East Boulder neighborhoods really look like? Um, I'm going to attempt to demonstrate this for the area of change where we're lovingly call, calling the um, Park West neighborhood because it's located on the west side of Belmont City Park. Um, and I'll mention that, I, you know, Sarah brought this up earlier, but I got an email from Sarah Silver yesterday. Um, I hope she doesn't mind me calling her out, but she described the challenge of trying to understand and visualize changes just based on maps. And this is something that I hear from our working group members and community members all the time. So we have been building a, a 3D model of the area. Our staff is all trying to get up to speed on the technology and how to share it with the community. Um, but the tools we're using are, you know, for, for lack of a better word, uh, really heavy. I can't, I can't fly around and be very nimble about it um, on a laptop with my home internet over Zoom. Uh, so I've got some diagrams I quickly made um, and some images of our model that I'm going to share. I hope that these are helpful and it would actually be really useful to get your input on, on these images, um, especially because we're trying to figure out the best way to communicate with the public um, who may or, or may not love maps as much as I do. So uh, we'll, give it, we'll give it a whirl. Okay, so um, not a map. This is that Park West neighborhood as it is today. Um, this is a bird's eye image from Google Earth. And so here's Belmont City Park, um, Belmont Road, Foothills Parkway, Pearl Street's down here. This is the Goose Creek Greenway. Um, and then this is Sterling. And this is also Sterling. If you spend a lot of time in East Boulder, you'll know that most of the streets surrounding Belmont City Park are called Sterling. <laughs> so. Okay, so then this is that same area with the with the place types applied. So this is that um, Parkside residential place type, the trail oriented live work. These um, two reddish areas are the hands on industrial. And then this is that Main Street industrial. So we've built out in our model what these place types could translate to and the types of spaces that um, we're hoping that they would generate. So this would be that Parkside residential opportunity. We're standing just south of Valmont Road in the park, and you can see how these townhome units front onto the park and these new residential homes would have this great access and connection to green space. As you make your way south, we're now at Sterling Drive. And this incorporates our ideas about upgrades to this street, as well as the potential for redevelopment and a key connection between the neighborhood and a more eventful entry into and out of the park than um, what's there today. So now we've, we've actually walked all the way beyond the south end of the park and you can start to see some of that trail oriented live workspace um, or place type along Goose Creek Greenway. Today, this greenway includes some flood control facilities and a multi-use path. It has some great views to the west, um, but it's not particularly attractive and doesn't offer a ton in the way of amenities. So the, the vision for this area is to make that greenway a, a centerpiece of the neighborhood where businesses and residents on either side could really enjoy the green space in this industrial area. So um, this, this image also shows some of the, the recommended street upgrades to Pearl Street, which is um, this guy here. Um, and then this image takes a closer look at how we're thinking about live work buildings of a more industrial nature in the area and repurposing space that today is um, along here. This is a really, really long driveway for uh, more of a kind of boardwalk where some of these light industrial businesses could actually start to incorporate a retail component. 
This is another um, bird's eye view demonstrating upgrades to Pearl Street, those live work buildings, and how we're hoping to build in great active public spaces as part of redevelopment to create those third places in the neighborhood that generate great activity and help create local destinations for community members. So, you know, I just want to reiterate that this plan is about evolving neighborhoods and and evolution is a process that builds off strengths and little by little over time becomes something greater. So, um, I, you know, that was a lot of information, but wait, there's more. Um, I'm sure there's questions, um, but they might just get answered by our consultants. So hang tight. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Jay Rankins and Mark De La Torre to talk to you about another key site in East Boulder, the 55th and Arapaho station area. And I will stop sharing. So I think, um, Mark, you should be able to share your screen. Excellent. Thanks, Kathleen. And thanks again for the opportunity to be able to discuss with you tonight, kind of where we've gotten through on the 55th and Arapaho Station Area Master Plan. As you all know, we're nesting into a much larger effort and excited to dig into the details with you. Briefly wanted to introduce myself. My name is Mark Delatory. I'm the consultant team project manager for this effort with MIG. I'm joined by Jay Rankins, our Director of Denver Area Operations and Principal with the firm, as well as Josh Mellum from Apex Design, the Transportation Consultant, and Rachel Shenman from EPS, Economic and Planning Systems, our Market Analysts. So I'm going to go through a quick 10-minute presentation and then uh, hand it back on over to Kathleen. So uh, going to try and again compress about a year's worth of work into about 10 minutes or so. So I'm gonna gloss over a couple of those things on the early end, but breaking it down into existing conditions of community engagement to really direct kind of how we got to where we're at. And then we'll focus more specifically on land use, mobility and urban design. <clears throat> Beginning with the area of focus for the station area master plan, we are on the Southern edge of the larger East Boulder sub-community plan cornered around 55th and Arapaho. It's relatively, or about 60 acres south of the, the rail line, uh, just on that northern edge there. And we got through the technical analysis and our initial input from a land use and transportation perspective, uh, really saw that there's an opportunity to leverage that transit investment as part of the identified <clears throat> East Arapaho transportation plan by creating a mix of uses in the area and better utilizing land use and zoning policies to create and affect some of that change that Kathleen was noting to deliver those attractable attractive and walkable neighborhoods and, and kind of maintain that unconventional personality and, and local culture. Uh, there's also opportunities to create additional bike and ped connectivity, building on, again, that initial transit investment and then focusing more specifically on mobility hubs, both at about the stations and throughout the rest of the development area. Uh, and lastly, and a really important one, and it goes back to identifying that, that character and, and flavor of this area, there's, there's a strong desire and need to balance the provision of new amenities with very rightful concerns around gentrification. So the maintenance of that character and culture uh, in balance as we move forward into considering change. From a market standpoint, there's a strong demand for office, industrial flex, retail, multifamily, from a suite of complementary uses in the area. However, there's no current incentive for redevelopment. Our landowners and properties are, are doing well with the return. So uh, not a lot of incentive currently to change. So when we think about that opportunity for growth and change to, to you know, focus on, on the community, when you think about the types of, of policy and from a land use and, and um, uh, development standpoint that can affect that change. So that change as it won't likely won't occur without greater entitlements. Stamp engagement, <clears throat> we've been governed by uh, the, obviously the working group and we've been working with a great subcommittee from that group focused on the same specifically. We've had a chance to engage the Community Affairs Council and have hosted a number of public meetings and focus groups focused at different points in the process to help guide um, the vision components, the guiding principles, um, and, and the various concepts as we look through opportunities and constraints of the larger stamp, um, stamp boundary. Some of those guiding principles um, help not only think about conceptual development, but how we engage and spoke to the community to ask questions and ask for input. So prioritizing transit supportive strategies, obviously at the, the front, and, uh, front and center of this process, thinking about growth over time, right? Change doesn't happen overnight, looking out 20 years and how can we facilitate incremental change through appropriate sequencing and development and delivery of community amenities, and maintaining that flexible development framework that ultimately stays true to the community input that we receive throughout the process. Great, uh, so I'm gonna cover land use and mobility. Um, on the land use side of things, uh, Mark highlighted some of the key 
parts of that. And I think uh, Kathleen actually teed it up well talking about the greater sub area. There was concern about integrating any new development into the surrounding area, making sure that it was compatible. Um, There's concern about losing uh, some of the employment uh, space that is there currently. Um, and uh, also looking at ways that we could actually leverage the uh, transit and other transportation investments in the area. So in addition to what Gene had talked about with the improvements on 55th, uh, or sorry, along Arapaho, there's also plans to do a study along 55th. Um, so what we looked at was a, and we'll go back to that map in just a moment. We wanted to let you know what the legend was representing. So uh, thinking about those place types, um, so land use component, of course, but also thinking about form and transportation and uh, open space that would support those uses. We have four flavors within uh, that TOD mixed use land use designation uh, that is in the draft uh, subcommunity plan. The first is flex. Um, that is really uh, representative of what's in the Flatirons Business Park today. So uh, looking at some of that uh, extending south, uh, ball might fall in that category as well. Flex mixed use, uh, so that would be really an emphasis on the office and industrial, but in an introducing some retail and service on the ground floor. That would both serve the employment uh, uses in the area, but also uh, be accessible, especially with transportation improvements to uh, new and existing residents uh, in and nearby. Next is residential mixed use. Uh, so this would be predominantly residential uses, but again, with some neighborhood scale retail and personal services, uh, particularly on ground floors. Um, you could think about that on key intersections, on corners, among ground floors of mixed use buildings. And then finally, something that we're introducing uh, that is really, um, I think, representative of sort of an aspiration for the large area, but really trying to do it um, in a pretty condensed way, which is innovation mixed use. Uh, so this would be a combination of light industrial, creative office, retail services. You might have heard the idea of maker space or maker hoods. Um, so that really being that sort of active engaging ground floor. We know that we can't support retail everywhere across this area, but, but we would ideally have that in strategic locations. Um, so that's represented with that red hatch on the map there. So introducing a new connection east and west along uh, the alignment of Conestoga Court uh, that exists today, which could have uh, traditional retail as well as maybe some of the makers um, having uh, accessible showrooms and, and tasting rooms and things like that uh, for different uh, craft uh, retail. And then also along Arapaho, building on the success of some of the sort of disparate retail locations and uh, retail um, frontages that we have today. Um, but again, leveraging the, uh, the transit investment along Arapaho, uh, the planned BRT station at 55th in Arapaho, as well as a longer term regional uh, rail connection uh, that could come along uh, the north side of the area. Uh, we would hope that there would be a stop at 55th to create that close proximity to the BRT and some sort of a commuter rail. Um, you can see those uh, smaller purple asterisks throughout. Uh, we're representing some of the mobility hubs. I'll explain those in a little bit more detail than Gene did earlier. Uh, but you can see generally residential mixed use at the station itself, at the intersection of 55th and Arapaho, transitioning to that innovation mixed use to the north and ultimately heading west towards the ball campus into the hospital complex, transitioning to flex mixed use and flex. Thank you, Mark. Um, so we've gone through an exercise of doing an illustrative plan. Um, the biggest caveat on any sort of an illustrative plan at this stage of planning, um, and it's sort of the sub area plan scale, is I can guarantee that what gets built is not going to look like this. Well, the way reason we do this is to begin to articulate some of the design intent, um, the idea of having setbacks, of have not necessarily doing zero lot lines where we create a canyon effect. Um, but relating to the street in a more effective and meaningful way, uh, thinking about how these different uh, uses may be supported with structured parking uh, longer term versus just surface parking. Um, and then ultimately looking at and informing um, the block structure, the transportation network, and some of the market economics. The next slide actually begins to articulate some different ways that development could occur in the area. There was some, some concern among stakeholders that 
the transformation would happen overnight, that the city was going to come in and, you know, take people's property or force them to, you know, change uses. And uh, we've reassured folks that this is a 20 year vision uh, for the stamp area. And development could really happen in multiple ways. So it could be improvements to existing buildings uh, to accommodate existing or new uses, adaptive reuse, uh, infill of some of the surface parking lots, or maybe it is wholesale uh, redevelopment. But the really beautiful part about the vision for this area is that even if folks decide to stick with what they have today, uh, it fits. Obviously, we don't want everyone to decide that or there wouldn't be, you know, large transformation wouldn't be leveraging that public investment that'll be required. Uh, but, um, you know, there is a place for folks who want to stick with uh, some of the existing uses or existing form. Lastly, it would be height, um, really focusing uh, the highest development that we'd anticipate probably um, at the station just north of Arapahoe. Um, heading south, we transitioned to existing single family neighborhood and an attached uh, single family. Um, so we would be stepping down pretty, rather quickly to three or fewer stories. Uh, but as we head north to uh, the rail and across the Flatirons Business Park, um, stepping down to four stories and heading west uh, to, a, to probably a three story uh, scale. Um, next, looking at the transportation, mobility and circulation. Um, if you have questions, um, Jean and Josh, um, I'm sure will be able to answer those, but a quick highlight for you. Um, one of the things that we really want to do is leverage that transit investment, uh, not just along Arapahoe, but along 55th, um, looking at how do we make that more pedestrian and bicycle friendly um, and connecting folks to that in that first and final mile. Um, looking at a connected street network, um, really right now the street network, it, it supports the existing uses fairly well, but thinking about this vision about flex, residential mixed use, innovation mixed use, uh, we need to think about greater connectivity and access uh, to ensure that uh, we are creating a walkable, likable place. Um, we need to think about curbside management, thinking about those mobility hubs. On the map here, you can see we began to think about a hierarchy of streets, really building on the street standards and street classifications in other parts of Boulder, uh, but introducing some uh, important nuances. Um, so looking at uh, where do we have dedicated bike lanes along the major arterials, thinking about how do we create pet and bike connections where maybe a street does not, a, you know, is would not be planned. Um, so one important one would be along Conestoga Court, um, as I've mentioned earlier, this idea of an activation street, a really generous public realm, um, creating a cafe, seating zone, amenity zone, buffering the sidewalk from the streets, but creating a really uh, nice uh, area where people can bike in a mixed flow environment. We want this to be very slow, uh, where people are having to engage with each other and probably on street parking to support that retail and maker space. Next is a commercial street, pretty similar in its configuration, uh, but we would not anticipate uh, everywhere having those large amenity uh, cafe kind of seating zones. Um, the next is, uh, I believe, the residential street. I have a little lag here for a second. Oh, here we go. Commercial street with multi-use path. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, so this is uh, something that we see in a couple different places, the multi-use path being in place of a sidewalk and places where we could fit that uh, with a larger amenity zone where we might in, in, uh, anticipate higher volumes of pedestrians and or bicyclists or those using other micro mobility devices. Residential streets uh, really having that nice flavor and character with probably a little narrower sidewalk but having tree lined streets. Uh, again, having on street parking for visitors. And then I had mentioned that pedestrian bike access in places that might not have uh, traditional uh, vehicular access. And so uh, we've seen this be achieved in some more recent developments in other parts of Boulder, but uh, this would be something perhaps on the south side of the commercial, on the south side of Arapaho, uh, abutting the existing residential, a place where people in express a desire for new connections, but not wanting motor vehicles, you know, passing right through their backyards or next to their backyards. Um, last piece for me, and then we just have a couple of slides on urban design, um, is the mobility hubs. Um, I wanted to, uh, I guess, clarify because there were, have been some misconceptions. Uh, we're not talking about a big uh, facility right at 55th and Arapahoe. In essence, they're enhanced bus stops uh, serving the BRT at 55th and Arapahoe. Uh, we, would, we would anticipate structured parking distributed throughout um, the area, perhaps embedded a little deeper, could be a public parking structure, but not right along 55th or, or Arapahoe. 
Instead, this would be a series of different elements. Um, Gene mentioned several of those, the you know, e-bikes, e-scooters, um, but there could be uh, mobility-oriented retail, uh, thinking about enhanced pedestrian connections, amenities for those using a variety of modes, long-term bike parking uh, for someone maybe coming from the existing neighborhood to the south, wanting to use transit or visit some of these uh, businesses. So along the top there, you can see a variety of different uh, mobility hub elements. And then along the left, we started to think about where those might be applied throughout the area. Thanks. As Jay noted, we're just going to wrap up here with a few more slides, really focusing on the quality of the space. Uh, I think Kathleen noted it pretty well when she was trying to, or when she was describing the the Park West. When you when you're thinking through um, plan implications only at that that bird's eye view, you kind of lose a bit of the texture and the feel of the space. So we want to make sure that as we thought through the the implications of of scale and volume and and that that texture, right, the industrial identity and all those different aspects that we heard were were critical to this area and redevelopment. We wanted to make sure we were thinking about it in a way that aligned with the expectations for redevelopment, but also contributing to um, those, those more publicly oriented amenities, um, thinking about uh, those transit stops and those enhanced transit stops and those mobility hub elements and, and the character of those spaces in between. Thinking about improving that, that current, I think, um, presence perhaps along some of those major roadways. So looking north here on 55th, thinking about the conveyance of, of, of safe, uh, comfortable pedestrian and bicycle traffic uh, both north, uh, northward on 55th, as well as throughout the development itself. When we think about the extension of Conestoga, that was a pretty critical piece as it relates to the activation street. So as we're looking, as we're looking eastward here uh, on Conestoga and thinking about what the potential is for a new street to connect across 55th with redevelopment supporting that, we want to think about the texture of the architecture that's already there and help contribute to that that unconventional personality, right? That that flavor of this particular area thinking about being able to celebrate that industrial identity while still providing opportunity for redevelopment that can, in part, from a district standpoint, help to support that both financially and in, in the character of it. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Kathleen? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm gonna pull up the, the questions, let's see. Kathleen, do we want to go to um, just general clarifying questions first? Yeah, yeah, we can um, we can uh, stay so we can all see each other and um, answer any clarifying questions, I think, yeah. Great, oops, had trouble unmuting there. So yeah, I guess I was going to go ahead and look for hands, right, uh, Jean and and come and Kathleen is better and call on people. Uh, we don't have the raise. Oh, we do have the raise hand function, I guess. So you can either use the raise hand function or raise your physical hand. Uh, and I'll call on the order that I receive. See people. So um, John, your hand went up first. So go right ahead. And then um, let's try to keep. Um, we're going to try to keep it to twenty or um, twenty minutes, actually, because we have another section to go through. So try to keep your questions kind of brief. And if you have like additional elaboration you want to do, save that for the comments later. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, as uh, someone who's joined in a lot of the meetings associated with this effort, I, I appreciate uh, Kathleen's presentation there. So thank you. Um, I wonder if you could describe, Kathleen, uh, how this fits into the city bigger picture in terms of uh, what changes and impacts this plan might have on the availability, for example, of industrial land within the city, citywide, uh, so that we understand the marginal impacts on the city of, of what we're proposing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, um, when we look at industrial uses and, and how industry in Boulder is changing, I think, you know, the plan really tried to first preserve that industrial, um, general industrial land entirely. So for heavy manufacturing, um, we still, you know, have heard from the community that we want a place for that. And, and so the, the land use plan for East Boulder preserves that. The, um, the other, you know, 
um, maybe um, different changes or, or other types of changes related to that industrial land and how they may impact um, the city overall as we're increasing by a little bit that community industrial um, land use and the amount of acreage that's dedicated to that type of land use. And so that's really oriented towards smaller businesses, smaller um, types of manufacturing, smaller types of industrial. Um, and we've located those, you know, where we try to um, preserve some of that, the existing space for that, um, but also expanding the area for that along um, um, places where they have great access to transportation because that movement of goods is so important. So then, you know, that big change is um, the amount of light industrial land. And so that's where we've made a, a, a pretty significant shift in the amount of acreage that's dedicated just for light industrial, which today does allow, um, you can develop residential in light industrial today. Um, but it tries to be more intentional about how we talk about where um, the best places for integrating residential into light industrial are. Um, and so changing and updating, I think, that mixed use industrial land use category to be um, pretty specific about what we want those places to evolve to look like and, and to include. That's a, that's a change that I think um, will make a big difference in East Boulder, but we can also start to think about, you know, as we um, pick back up on the, the use table project, how does that, that shift the implications for, for uses in, in specifically industrial zones for other areas of the city? And are there other places in the city where we wanna be really intentional about incorporating um, residential or retail in a, in a way that allows greater density. Um, and that, that might be when we start to um, really start to apply that mixed use industrial land use category. So does that, is that answer your question? Well, partly, uh, I, I don't mean to uh, monopolize the discussion here, but if I can just follow up with one uh, additional uh, factor or related factor. And that is, can you point to other examples within the city of uh, successful mixed use industrial residential uh, development that we could uh, use as, a, as an example for what we're dealing with here? I think the place that um, people have gravitated to and that does have a mixed use industrial designation is the, the steel yards area. Um, I would say it's probably of a smaller scale than what we're envisioning for East Boulder. Thank you. Great. Sarah, I think you were next and I think uh, Alex, I saw your hand after that. Thanks so much. And uh, I'm gonna figure out how to bring my hand down in a second. Sorry about that. Um, so these are, I have two questions. They're both uh, numeric questions. Um, what is the breakdown in terms of um, dwelling unit types that are imagined for these um, anywhere from 2,600 to 4,600 new dwelling units? And what's the projected number of jobs expected over time to be produced as a result of all this um, the densification? So um, unfortunately, I don't have those numbers for you. And part of the reason that I don't have them, but that we had them under our scenario testing and, and that modeling is that for, um, for these land use recommendations, we're breaking a lot of our existing rules. And the, the parametric modeling that we used is built off of our existing zoning. And so, um, the types of units, um, we tried to describe that a little bit in the, in the place types. And you know, some of the feedback that we got from the working group is it'd be great to have images to go with those descriptions to give people a better idea of what those um, 
types of, of homes could be. So that's something that we're thinking about adding. And then um, similarly for the, for the jobs numbers, um, I'm not able to project that because it's, we've changed the rules of, of um, how that space gets generated. And so I can't, I can't model it quite yet. Will you be able to model it over time? Because uh, I would think from a planning perspective, uh, that would be valuable. Yeah, and, and that's part of, um, I think why we're trying to use these new digital tools is it will allow us to work back and forth to figure out um, how a specific code change or how, um, uh, a type of um, parking requirement might shift the amount of space that we're able to provide, might shift that unit count or shift the job, job projections. Can I just follow up on that? I'm sorry, David. I just, it's a follow up specifically to that question and it, it ties to John's question, which is, uh, I would, are you going to be doing some um, maybe econometrics forecasting since the value of the land is going to change with the opportunity for um, residential development in industrial areas, the value of the land is going to go up. And I think you, it would be, I'm wondering if you're going to be trying to figure that out. We, as of today, we do not have um, budget for that type of consulting that we would have to bring on a consultant to perform that. And there's um, no money allocated for that. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Alex, um, did you have your hand up before? And then I think uh, Hutch also has his hand up after you. And then Mark. I did not. I'll go ahead and unmute Alex. I didn't have my hand up. Mark can go ahead. Oh, you didn't? Okay, so I think Hutch, um, Hutch you go by Hutch, right? Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic uh, to the industrial themes that I was hearing, but uh, as a, as a non-planning guy, I'm on the tab. Uh, I, I'm curious whether there's any, you know, rent number per square foot or any other attributes of the space, which is basically required for our industrial stuff to survive? And if so, what is it? And how does that factor into all these amazing looking improvements that we make? Because it, it strikes me these spaces are probably renting for pretty much what they can get now in, in Boulder's industrial marketplace. So. I'm, I'm trying to think about the economics of the future industrial space if a whole bunch of improvements have gone in in various ways and who would be there and if those actually exist or whether we're just not sure. Yeah, I might um, actually ask Rachel from EPS who's been working on the 55th and Arapaho Station area from um, a market perspective to weigh in on that. Definitely. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so like Kathleen mentioned, um, I'm with Economic and Planning Systems and we're on the MIG team. Uh, and we did the market analysis for the station area master plan, but the general market trends can be applied to the broader East Boulder area. Um, and the, the industrial piece is, it's an interesting characteristic of this area and it's a great question. And this gets back to the first question as well. There's a couple of things going on. Um, one is the nature of the industrial uses in the area. The building stock, generally speaking, is older industrial, and the, the tenants that are there um, are utilizing the space. But what we heard, um, we did sort of secondary data research and then also interviews um, with, with real estate professionals active in the area. Um, and what we heard was that once, once companies outgrow their space, um, they, they leave the area just because there isn't a space physically large enough for their use or, you know, newer industrial, the, the ceiling heights are higher, the bay requirements are different, and, and the physical building stock in the area just doesn't meet that requirements right now. And to your question, 
um, if the building stock in this area is going to change, it's likely not going to be that sort of true industrial space. Um, it's just simply cheaper to build that space in, say, Broomfield. Um, and there's also, in terms of the users of the spaces, um, there's there's what looks like an industrial building on the outside, and then there's who's actually inside it. Um, and what we found is that a lot of the building stock in the area is actually being utilized as more of this flex space, whether it's research and development, um, your, your sort of fun functional office space. Um, and so the, the rents that you can get from a more office oriented user are higher. And so who's in these spaces tend to be these more office oriented users who are paying more than an industrial user would pay. And so when we look at the changes and we've done some, some redevelopment modeling to look at um, what, what could go into these spaces with some of these mixed use prototypes. Um, and generally speaking, you're, you need a, a flex or a high paying office user. Um, and then there's, there's the impact that new tech users are having on the market. Um, and when you have um, some tenants who are just willing to pay more, um, and that's where to, to Mark's earlier point during the presentation about no incentive for redevelopment, um, the buildings in this area are performing very well. They're generally pretty full and they're commanding high rents um, without that much reinvestment because there is this demand for this older industrial space to function more as office. Um, and so that's a, a somewhat roundabout uh, way to answer your question. We do have numbers. Um, we did a, a market analysis for the subcommunity plan in terms of actual numbers. Um, you know, for the quote unquote industrial spaces, it's sort of anywhere from 16 to $30 a foot um, or more. And if you're if you're building new or redeveloping, you're looking at the high end of that just in terms of land and materials costs um, to make a redevelopment work. So and it is a challenge. It's um, it's a challenge throughout the city and, and this area is no different. All right, um, Mark, did you want to go next? Sure, thanks. Um, uh, I, I take it from some of the prior questions that there is um, an assumption that by having more density, we'll have more jobs. And by having more jobs, we have more in, -compute, in commuters, et cetera. So, um, I think I look at it differently in the sense of uh, really the point of much of this change in zoning. And, and I, what I'm asking, I'll ask this as a question of staff, isn't the point to, um, by densifying vertically and providing live work spaces that we in fact uh, eliminate in commuting while maintaining our economic vitality for a, a broad range of, of businesses. And I, and I think about what COVID has done for many workers who have discovered the joys of working from home. I've worked from home for over 20 years. Um, and for people who paint cars for a living or repair bikes for a living, uh, they haven't been able to do that. But with a really truly um, live work space, uh, suddenly that's possible. And suddenly you eliminate commutes and enhance the life for a lot of people that uh, outside of uh, kind of sitting in front of a computer screen tech work, haven't been able to enjoy those kind of benefits. So um, uh, I guess my question is, uh, isn't that the point of, of really creating a broad range of live work spaces in this area? Um, I would say, yes, uh, you know, I think that's a major component of the strategy and the idea of introducing residential and the idea of creating these denser neighborhoods is to get some cars off of the road and really be able to provide people with um, those options for um, maybe living down the street from their office, maybe working from home, but being able to run down and grab a sandwich. Um, all of all of you know the benefits that come with um, kind of a, a more urban neighborhood are um, major components of of 
both the strategy and I think major benefits to, um, you know, changing some behaviors around uh, driving by yourself in your car to work. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, gosh, I don't see any hands up. Uh, so maybe I'll just ask a quick, oh, and then Lupita. Um, can I ask first and then you, Lupita? Uh, so my question just was for uh, Jean uh, Sansom. Uh, when I looked at the, um, the uh, connection uh, plan uh, recommendations, uh, there were just a couple of things that are in the TMP master plan that I didn't see. And I, um, I don't know if I should be worried about that. Uh, one that I noticed was one that comes up, has come up a couple of times, which is a connection from that uh, levee uh, path uh, into the Central Avenue Park at the uh, southern, uh, south uh, uh, kind of eastern part, as well as that northern connection. And another one is just out by the um, airport road uh, connection from the, the bike park out to the backs of all those buildings that we're still kind of, so I just want to if you could just assure us uh, whether we're giving up on those or those just uh, didn't come up as something from this particular plan and that we're, we could, we're still looking at them from the master plan. So are there two separate separate views? Yep, David, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so the connections plan, um, thank you, is not necessarily intended to identify all of the projects which are currently in the TMP. But one thing that I didn't mention in the presentation is that we are doing a scrub, if you will, of all of the 87 TMP projects that are located in the East Boulder subcommunity. So, for example, you mentioned um, the connection to South Boulder Creek to the multi-use path. Um, what we're recommending to do is to consolidate those to one connection on the north and one connection on the south where, where they're feasible. So I know that planning board in particular um, had to address that issue with a development review that came through um, and the issue of being able to cross that levee um, was one that prevented the construction of that multi-use path. So that is an example of where we are identifying those changes that we need to make to the TMP to ensure that we can continue to um, advance the intent of providing, for example, connections between the Flatiron Business Park and the South Boulder Creek multi-use path, but do so in a way that we know is viable. Um, and then I would say the same, for example, the connection up, um, I think you mentioned one, to Airport Boulevard, part of which is being constructed, part of which is being reevaluated today to understand what some of the um, more viable connections might be around the airport area given some FAA restrictions. So what you're going to see as we continue to work through this, and thanks for bringing this map up, um, is you're going to see a list of recommendations for changes that we'd like to see made to the TMP. Um, you've seen some of the additions that we would like to make to the TMP. And then there are a series of connections, here we go, that we are recommending to be removed, either again, because it was not considered a feasible connection, or you'll notice many of these connections, um, north-south connections to the east of 55th, north of Arapaho, which were part of what was called the East Arapaho Connections Plan, a plan that was developed several years ago, um, but was not fully vetted um, by property owners and the community and was not in fact accepted by city council, but had somehow made its way into the TMP. So again, we're looking at a lot of cleanup. Um, so I would say thank you for paying attention to that. And if there are specific um, projects that you don't see um, either in the list of changes or those to, to be removed or amended, please continue to let us know so that we can stay on top of that. Great, thank you. And I'm sure Tab will be uh, reviewing those going forward too. And I just, uh, I wanted to hear that from your team. Thank you so much. Uh, Lupita, you were next, and then we're going to go with uh, Georgie. Okay. So um, I think Kathleen was the person who made the statement about that you felt excited about going and breaking rules. And I'm in, I'm, I'm in um, intrigued by what rules you were not willing to break. So I mean, trying to get at what has been the criteria that really is, you know, is central to you in this project. And that, that's my first question. So um, was there something that you were not willing to do in this exercise? You know, that's a great question. We haven't gone through, um, I would say, a, a really comprehensive um, evaluation of the 
the code changes that we would be making. But I think, you know, the pieces of um, the comprehensive plan that spoke most to this process and that was most consistent with what we heard from the community members um, was really, you know, the, the description of design quality, um, the commitment to 15 minute neighborhoods. Um, and I think, you know, we are really looking for um, opportunities to advance some of our climate goals in this area. Um, and so those are probably the, the, the pieces of the comp plan that um, stand out in my mind. I think the, the, the challenge, the biggest challenge of, of the community process and um, determining how far the community wants to go related to our housing goals has been um, the, the one where I, I think the working group and the community has um, displayed really a, a pretty wide range of opinion on whether or not they want to um, have a ton of new housing in this area and, and change a lot of industrial land um, versus maintain all industrial land and have no new housing. Um, so that that's the one that was, I think, the most challenging to find the sweet spot for. Okay, so I had other questions. Um, and maybe maybe I'll, I'll just ask one more and then if we have a chance, we can come back. But um, so in a in, in more direct way or succinct way, um, this question already came up in terms of how does this project specifically can help us address our, you know, housing and work uh, or jobs imbalance. Yeah, that has must have had must have happened in the discussions. It must have come up because that that is one of our biggest challenges in the city. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when we um, tested those um, scenarios in the fall under our current code, we had really um, significant jobs projections. Um, I think that the number of jobs in the area almost doubled, um, and um, also, you know, pretty significant increase in housing units. So there's only 313 um, homes there today. There's 17,000 jobs. Um, this plan, you know, brings, um, I think, an average of, of 3,500 new homes to the area. So we're not even with the number of jobs, but I think what we heard from the community was that um, creating a one-to-one -one ratio in this area of the city is not what we're going for. We do want this to continue to be a job center, but we're strategically trying to integrate um, those housing opportunities to give people an option to live in East Boulder and support some of the existing businesses and workforce that are there by providing them with, with an opportunity to live near where they work. So just so that I get, I, I, I'm clear on the, the approach that you guys taking, that your floor is not create more jobs that will increase art imbalance. That's your floor, making sure not necessarily that you, you help us close the gap that we have, but you at least won't increase it. Is that, am I interpreting this? I don't, or not I don't think close? that that's a, no, I don't think that that's a, a characterization that that represents the land use changes. I think um, from some of Rachel's work um, and from what we know about how industrial space is changing and being used, um, a lot of that larger warehouse space um, that maybe at some time, you know, supported 10 jobs can support significantly more. And, and I might ask Rachel to weigh in if, if she has thoughts about that. But you know, I do think that with increased density and with redevelopment in this area, it's realistic to expect um, there to be more jobs here in the future. Okay, so 
So we're not saying that though. So I just want to be clear in which direction yep. you are guys taking us. And, you know, I'm, I think that just to be clear, we want to go in this direction and you're taking us that direction. I just want to be clear. That's how I'm reading this. And let, we'll, we can also discuss that when we give feedback as well. Let, let me give Georgie a chance to ask a question and then we'll see if we want to do double dipping based on our time because we're over 20 minutes now. So okay. uh, go ahead, Georgie. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, Lupita's questions were along kind of the same line that I was going to go. Um, so I, 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 I wanted to understand a little bit more. Maybe, Rachel, you can elaborate because I heard you talk about how industrial is being used for office. Um, and I, I have great concerns about that because it, it does two things. Number one, it displaces ultimately industrial because those, those renters can, can pay significantly more. And then, um, and then obviously the density of that office space. I thought Mark painted a beautiful picture of a bike mechanic you know, living and working here. But then I heard Rachel talk about how this industrial space is really being used by high tech office. And so I'd like to understand that difference and also kind of go back to what Lupita was saying around Kathleen. I heard you say about 3,500 homes added and potentially double the amount of jobs is sort of a general ballpark. Is that, and that's two separate questions. So maybe I'll start with the question to Rachel is, is how this space is being used and how do we make sure as a city it's being used for industrial and not high tech office? Um, are, there, are there land use or zoning things that we can do to prevent the escalation of rents, to pre prevent the densification of this industrial space that's you know, more suit, may, maybe the community is looking more towards manu light manufacturing, et cetera? Yeah, that's um, a great question. And that's um, sort of a, a realm of ideas that guided a lot of this analysis. Um, there's a couple components of that. One piece is, is what the market is already doing. Um, and part of that is just, you know, what industrial space in general is doing. To my point earlier about um, the, the physical nature of the space, um, the industrial space in this area works for some users at some times. Um, a lot of these uh, companies will move in and then grow, which is great. Um, they're growing, they're building, but that there just isn't physically the space for them in the area anymore. And that's when you see them move maybe to Gun Barrel, more likely to Long, Longmont or Bloomfield, just for that physical space. Then there's also the, the functional space um, and that gets to the older nature of the building stock and that's a lot of times from from sort of the market evolution perspective when we see these other sort of alternative user tenants come in because there is that older building that's at its base keeper not really functioning for the originally intended user anymore and can be repurposed um, and there is this this tension between the sort of long-standing industrial nature of the area and the way the market is moving with these new, um, not always office users, some of them really are flex users where they need sort of the larger spaces, the higher bays, um, they're doing R&D, they're doing, they need, you know, manufacturing space, say. Um, and part of how we're getting at this from sort of a, a policy perspective um, is looking at um, what, what the area looks like and how we, in a sense, curate some of the uses we're looking for. And so one of the ideas that we're looking at is a district for a number of functions, um, part of which is parking, um, but also looking at what, what these first four uses are and can we encourage and keep and preserve some of the smaller, more industrial users. Um, to Jay's earlier point about these makers or that this maker space, um, because that, that really is one of the, the biggest opportunities in this area. The large scale industrial users, um, for better or for worse, are likely to migrate out. It's just the nature of the evolving market. At the end of the day, the, the land values in this area are too high to support traditional industrial use. Um, if, you're, if you're redeveloping the, you know, the rents per square foot you can get for an industrial building versus 
an office or flex building, it, they just don't support development given the land value in the area. Um, but how can we keep some of that industrial nature of the space through um, curating some of that first floor space, creating affordable, smaller scale industrial for those startups or small businesses to start. And eventually maybe they will grow and have to move out, but, but maintaining that character in the area. So, so does that mean that the uses, the land uses that we're talking about include office as a use? Yes, office is an allowed use. And I, I don't, um, I don't want to give an impression that all of the industrial space in East Boulder is being used for office. There really are artists in the area. Falafel King really does manufacture hummus here. Um, we have a lot of catering companies, and these are users that um, um, can make. A smaller industrial space work, but they need high ceilings, they need um, some of these HVAC requirements. And those are the types of things that we can control through our code, the size of spaces, the heights of, um, of buildings, of, of floors. Um, and then, you know, the, the use table project is, is a place where um, it, it's possible to get into the details of um, really specifics about what's allowed or not allowed in different types of zones. That's that's helpful. I, I guess, and I'll, I'll stop and, and let someone else chime in. I guess my, my my concern is if office is categorized as a use here, and Rachel just said the highest and best use is office, and this is a 20-year plan, how does this ultimately just not migrate to high rent, high tech office if that's permitted in this use? Um, I, I think it's uh, a threat, but we have to be really careful about, um, you know, preventing office from using some of these spaces. Um, office workers make up a, a really important component to our local economy. Um, and also, um, there are um, maybe smaller businesses, creative businesses like um, um, architects or um, advertising agencies that um, need smaller space, need smaller office space. And when we um, restrict those uses, they also have nowhere to go in, in the area. So it's a balancing and finding um, and you know, maybe as Rachel said, it, curating those office uses is um, really important. Yeah, if I, if I could chime in really fast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Jay. Yeah, one example that um, we are very familiar with is the Centrally side in Portland. Um, they've actually gone through pretty nuanced uh, zoning regulations um, whereby uh, there's a certain flavor of this industrial mixed use that does allow kind of the full flex you know office and, and industrial but there's others where industrial does have to be the primary use and office is subservient to the industrial so if you're gonna have office it has to be an office that's in support of an industrial use um, what they have found and what we're thinking about at least for the station area is that the industrial uses um, while there are some examples you can find of maybe going vertical with industrial you know second third story buildings more sort of hearkening way back um, to some of the industrial um, most of that desire is for the ground floor space and so what we're talking about with the station area is being more restrictive on the ground floor and then being more permissive on the upper floors where maybe there is multifamily residential um, or office allowed in those upper floor spaces thank you um so we are um uh, almost to 30 minutes now. Um, are we okay for uh, looping back? I see that John and Sarah each have want to take a second pass. Are we okay with that? And then we'll hopefully we can move on to then uh, the questions. So John, why don't you start? Let me, okay. Uh, this is a, 
for Kathleen, I, I know that in the uh, meetings that uh, were held in association for this project, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about uh, whether to devote a uh, housing area to what we call missing middle or whether to focus more on providing stacked flats for affordable housing. Um, of course, that leads to very different outcomes in terms of both the type and the quantity of housing supplied. Uh, can you talk about uh, the status of that uh, distribution? Yeah, so we, um, the, the working group really pinpointed um, locations in those areas of change where they thought would be most appropriate to fill um, that missing middle category and, and provide um, those types of homes. And so that, um, thought is built into those neighborhood descriptions and the place type performance standards. Okay. And uh, oh, oh, so just, just, just to follow up real quick. So is what's in there now, is that the, the staff recommendation about uh, what sort of the nature and distribution of housing that should be developed here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're working on all of this material every day, but um, I think we're getting closer and closer on those place types to um, be pretty solid in our, our recommendations for um, how that gets mapped out and, and what the standards include. Thank you. Great. And Sarah, do you want to? Super, super easy question. The train stop. The train stop is at 55th, uh, just south, just north of Conestoga, or 63rd, which was my recollection of where it was originally going to be. So yes, originally I think planned for 63rd, and as part of um, this subcommunity plan, uh, a recommendation is that we would um, consider either adding to or moving that station to 55th. But I might let Jean Sanson talk a little bit more that, about that because she's um, involved in the Northwest Rail study. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so um, just real quickly, there is a renewed interest and motivation um, at the state level and by RTD and um, potentially Amtrak to look at a um, peak service commuter rail um, sooner rather than later um, between Denver, Boulder and Longmont. Um, that peak service would include one station in Boulder, and that would be located at Boulder Junction. The idea is to try to build something that might that would be less expensive than the full build out with more stations, such as one out in East Boulder. So the idea is if and when RTD and other partners are looking to um, construct a, the full build out of Northwest Rail, and we would like to see a station in the East Boulder area, we would like to look at the area around 55th as opposed to 63rd. That's the recommendation. Uh, but there's a lot of, as with much of our transportation stuff, there's a lot of assumptions in there. There's assumption of money, the assumption of, uh, right, okay, just as long as we know. Thank you. Yes. Great. Okay, well, um, I'll go ahead and share my exciting little thing that we're going to, Gene and I uh, are going to use here. So um, what we have uh, three key issues that we're going to go through now, I think, before we have a presentation on public outreach, right, for the uh, in the fall. So um, we thought we'd try to uh, keep everybody on their toes and start with a random person and then go through an alphabetical order. And Gene, I don't know if you noticed, but Robert Hutchinson wasn't in the list because uh, I wasn't sure he was going to be here. So if you could add him between John Gerstle and Mark McIntyre. So I'm spinning the wheel and the winner is Alex. So uh, Alex, you will lead us off, I think. Is that what it says? No, it's Georgie. It went one past you, Alex. Sorry about that. So we can start <laughs> with uh, Georgie, and then we're going to go through. And then I probably won't bother to share the next time I spin, unless people really like to look at it. So with yeah. that, um, Jean, go ahead and put up the key questions. Uh, let's, we'll let's put up the key questions, but I might suggest that we do a short break. Oh, um, that's right. Thank you for reminding me. Let's do our break. And uh, we'll reconvene at uh, 7.47, 10 minute break. David? Yes, Lupita. 
while people go away and take a break, which I will do too, I uh, just want to mention you misspelled my last name. Oh, I will fix that. I guess I'll have to display the spinner again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Next one. Okay. Oh, Gene, if you're still there, would you mind putting up the questions while we're still while we're on break? Oh, too late. Sorry, Georgie, was that for me? Okay, Kathleen's got that. Great. Thanks. Well, I'm glad you heard that since Georgie's going first, Paul. <laughs>
I can't believe I forgot the break, Sarah. I get I get so into this Zoom world. It's like <laughs> I just uh, I, I it, it isn't intentional. I know I'm supposed to be trying to do more frequent short breaks, but no. But this was this has been such an interesting conversation. I think letting it <laughs> flow was the right was the right thing to do. Well, then I, I, I mean, we did a little longer than, than the usual five to seven minutes, so that's good. So. Uh, and Jean, you're okay uh, then calling on people and we're gonna, once we're all back together, I'll just hand it over to you and then I'll spin in between. That's fine, yeah, so that was the, I think we just should clarify the intention that we would go question by, go through all of the land use con uh, comments first and then move on to the connections comments. And right, and then I'll spin the wheel between one and two and between two and three. Okay. And then we, I can display the spinner for the last spin so that Lupita sees that I, I, I'm spelling. I'm sorry about that. I actually, I, I typed in all the names without like looking at anything. And so I'm surprised um, there might be other typos in there, who knows. Um, David, you'll have to send me your, the link for the spinner. Yeah, if I like it. Sure it's so cool. It's just like, it, it's just like this silly website and all you do is you put a list of things in and it makes the wheel immediately. It's so cool. <laughs> I've used it for nonprofits for like a raffles for nonprofits to raise money. <laughs> it's like one of those icebreakers for when you're not actually in the same room. <laughs> I, I too would like a link to the spinners. You know, Mark. <laughs> I'll send it to I'll send it to both <laughs> boards. I, I don't think it's considered a serial meeting if I send out a, a link to a website. Great. So uh, awesome. I think we're all starting to convene. Um, looking for cameras to go back on. So um, let's go ahead and uh, and then uh, Jean Jean will lead us then through the, the key questions. We'll I'll um, we'll go I'll answer. Try to keep our comments down to as close to, you know, one to two minutes as we can. I know that there's a lot to go through. And uh, Jean, go, go ahead and take it away. That's awesome. Great. Um, and so we'll start with Georgie and then um, followed by Tila and Dave and then John Gerstel. Okay. Um, so first question, do boards support the recommended land use plan? Um, I, first, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it, was, it was really interesting. And I think the work looks and sounds great. Um, I, I sort of toward the tail end of our conversation, kind of got to the meat of the issues that that I have on on land use here. Um, and that while it sounds and looks great using the term industrial, I I, I think in order to for me to be supportive of it, um, I'd, I'd like that definition of what light industrial is to be much tighter um, because what I hear the market doing versus what we intend as a community may be different. Um, and if the highest and best use of this light industrial is high tech office and that is a permissible use within this space, um, I, I have no doubt that it will migrate towards that and that um, we will we will exacerbate our jobs housing imbalance and we will continue to eliminate the industrial and light industrial that the community desires here. Um, I also heard I, you know the, the increase in housing I think is great from 313 to over 3500 homes. But again, if we are are potentially doubling or more, the jobs that will or could exist here, then we're taking Boulder backwards um, in, um, in what we can do as far as in commuting. And while you know, I understand that some people will now be able to live on site, the net effect to Boulder um, will be detrimental on a commuting standpoint, um, as well as the, the overall imbalance that this would create. Uh, and um, so the, I, I guess, I'd like to separate the ideal from what will happen and try to isolate what could happen and make sure we address it um, 
before we we just idealize what light industrial could be here. So that's that's my response. Thank you. Thanks, Georgie. How about Tila? Hi. Um... Thank you for the presentation and especially for all of the background uh, information at the end of the packet, all of the, uh, the detail on the, on the meetings. It was really informative uh, and shows how long and coming this process has been. I'm here tonight mostly uh, looking at the transportation side of things. I have very little to say on the land use except to say that I do um, support um, this proposed plan. Um, I am sensitive to sort of some of the nomenclature being a little dense uh, and when you hear something like mixed use industrial, you expect it to be industrial uses and to sort of exclude kind of uh, office uses. I, I think that's a, a fair critique. Um, and it might just be a, a mistake in labeling, but not really. I, I do think that there has been some expression of um, a preference to keep some light industrial uses, but it also includes a whole lot of service industry things that are hard to define. So this is definitely a step in the right direction. And in particular, um, expanding the use of mixed use development in general. I think that's something that's sorely missing uh, throughout Boulder and to the extent that this will increase um, flexibility of thinking, flexibility um, of, of permitting, flexibility for, for using spaces differently and less rigidly than in the past. I think this is an excellent step in the right direction. Great, thanks Tila. Okay, next Dave and then John Gerstel and then Hutch. Great. Um, well, I'll just say that um, yes, uh, from a from a land use perspective, um, I'm I'm generally supporting this. Um, land use is a higher level uh, designation, and we are defining new uh, categories to meet new demands and new times. Uh, the concerns that I'm hearing are valid, and so um, I think that it will be important as we as we go forward to uh, try to get more granular. Uh, I think that the place types were a step from the last time we looked at the plan uh, that was pretty informative on that. And then of course that raises more questions because it is more, more, more informative. So when we see place types, suddenly we're seeing some of the visions of what can go in there. I do think that with place types, perhaps um, we can start looking at uh, a little bit more granular percentages of different uses that we'd like to see. And, and the, out of those place types, I assume that we'll have new zoning districts, not the existing set of zoning districts. So we have some flexibility to maybe address some of these concerns of, oh gosh, we don't want 80% office space in these buildings. We want, you know, 40% or something. So to try to uh, to try to get you know get a little bit more precise on on the percentages of the different kinds of uses we'd like to see, and then look at zoning mechanisms to drive that. Um, but MUI is uh, makes sense to me. Uh, MUTOD is something that we've sorely needed in this city. A, a transit oriented zone is a wonderful thing to see in this city. Uh, we don't have it yet, and places that are are looking at uh, how to center. Uh, appropriate density around development or transit corridors are happening all over the world and all over the country. And I think it's great that Boulder is taking that step. Uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thanks, Dave. Okay, um, John and then Hutch. Okay. Um, well, I, I have to say that uh, I think uh, George made excellent points. And in general, I, I agree with his thoughts on that. My concern, as, as my colleagues on planning board uh, know, has long been uh, with what actually happens in industrial areas when they get developed or redeveloped. And the latest example was in the gun barrel area, Celestial Seasonings, where we saw what is intend intended to be a, an industrial area uh, being developed for a, a purely residential project. And uh, given the, the use codes, uh, we, we didn't have any uh, control over that. We had to allow it. And I think that's exactly what will happen here, either with uh, in terms of residential or office uses in what's, uh, what is called here mixed use industrial. And, and so I think that that has to be much more firmly uh, controlled before I would be willing to support the land use plan that is being proposed here. Um, 
Secondly, uh, another concern I have is to be more explicit about how the residential uh, activity takes place. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about uh, the decision about how much gets devoted to, uh, to uh, high density stacked flats type developments and how much might be allocated to what, what we call missing middle type uh, developments. Because I think when people talk about live work situation and they talk about people living in this area and working in this area, we have to provide, if we're serious about that, we need to provide the sort of housing that the people who are working in this area would, would seek. And that is, I think in, in many cases, what, what we call the missing middle. Um, so I'd like to make that point. Um, and thirdly, I, I think that we have spoken in very general terms about both the, uh, the Valmont power plant area and, and again, uh, we've uh, almost not spoken about what happens uh, in the airport area, both the airport itself directly and uh, the area surrounding it, which is now primarily industrial. And I, I have no problem with that, but I think we should, uh, that should be explicitly discussed in the land use plan. And, and we haven't talked about that tonight or, or very much in the past at all. And with respect to the airport itself, I'm very aware that that uh, the city has commitments to the uh, FAA that it needs to honor, but we're talking about what happens in the long term. And we need to have some explicit discussion about what we think is going to happen at the airport in the long term. I'm not saying that we shut it down within the next 20 years even, but this planning effort is supposed to be thinking about what happens over a period longer than that. And uh, <clears throat> thirdly, at the, uh, or maybe I'm on four now, <laughs> at the, at the Valmont power plant, uh, we have talked in very general terms about the desirability of uh, eventually having that facility as some sort of a cultural or arts facility, among other things. And I think that's, that's an excellent idea. But in those discussions, we need to be aware both of the uh, cleanup concerns of the power plant, and also the fact that uh, the water rights in the lake that uh, make that area very attractive will probably continue to be held by public service or Excel until they sell it when they decide they don't need it anymore. And that could uh, may lead to a, a big change in, in the nature of that area if there's no more, more lake there. Baseline Reservoir. Uh, no, sorry, not Baseline Reservoir, but Belmont Lake. So uh, those are just a few of my concerns. Thanks, John. Okay, Hutch, you're up, followed by Mark and then Lupita. Is Hutch still here? Um, and do we want to take the uh, the questions down just so that we can see each other? A little more. I think folks know what those are, at least for the rest of this round. Um, Fine. Okay. All right, Hutch, if you're here, you can go ahead. You can unmute. Okay, we'll circle back and give Hutch a, a, a turn. Perhaps he just stepped away for a moment. Mark, are you ready? I am. Great. Um, I'm going to break some of my own rules and not really answer those particular questions. Um, I just have a couple comments. First, I, I really want to honor the work of staff and the working group, having been part of uh, working groups that have taken 18 months, two years to do their work. Um, I was always sensitive when people who were not part of the working group came up and said, well, did you think about this? Did you think about that? And it's like, well, yes, we did. <laughs> so anyway, I, 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 um, I think that, that what was presented here uh, represents a tremendous amount of work and I'm generally very supportive of it. 
Um, regarding connections, and I talked with Jean a little bit, Jean um, Sinson uh, today, uh, a little bit about this. And I, I spent some really time, I spent some good time with the maps. And I've come to the conclusion that what I'd really, what for me as a transportation advisory board member would be super helpful is to show a, a simple map showing all of the um, non-automotive connections currently with the gaps highlighted and then a subsequent map showing how we would treat those gaps uh, and the gaps might be segments that are missing or the gaps might be areas that are too large um, uh, too large an area without uh, a, a cycling transit pedestrian connection i find the current mapping to be really hard, to be really challenging, uh, even for a map guy to kind of get my head around of what, what it means. Is this something that's going to be built or not? So anyway, I would ask. I, that, can I just, yeah. uh, we are going to get to the connections question next. Okay. Uh, this one, and, and you, you okay. acknowledged that you were going to, you, you weren't, you were going to break your own rules. Um, okay. I'm just going to okay. try to keep us to land use right now, and we'll do connections with okay. that. Okay. You know, I did this last time. I answered, I, I, the other questions were on the screen. I asked, okay. All right. I'll get to land use. Um, we'll forgive you. Okay. Sorry. Well, you can skip me on connections then, okay, uh, in, in trying to get us done on time. In regard to land use, I spent some time with the plan looking at this and looking at it in light of the city's uh, latest climate commitment, which is 70% reduction from 2018 by 2030. That's eight years. And I don't see under the land use um, design here, serious commitments that change the built environment in ways that are quantifiable by saying how many more, if we build this, how many more bike ped transit trips are we able to shift from vehicles, from single occupancy vehicles or uh, other vehicles um, how, how, what will, what will this do to our VMT? Uh, what will this do to induce bike pad transit trips? How will this, um, these land uses, uh, uh, house workers that are currently in commuting? And so I, I see this in, in many city documents where we have, we have these really aggressive goals and, and our current and our current plans and plans and documents that are under construction don't fully address our climate commitment. And that's, that's my single biggest criticism of land use connections. Every aspect of this is that uh, it doesn't seem to um, take into account the latest uh, urgent commitment of the city to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2030. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Lupita, then Sarah, then Alex. Make sure first. We can hear you, Lupita. Sorry, I forgot. I pressed the wrong button. I wanted to be in mute and not missing my face. Sorry about that. I was here. Um, so, yeah, I think I spoke a little bit in the land use. I am a little bit concerned, actually more than a little bit concerned. I am seriously concerned about uh, the direction in which a project like this takes us by looking at the land use that allow us to increase the gap between our, um, you know, housing needs and the job uh, creation. Um, also, in terms of the uh, light, or the industrial use, which has been in our conversations in the last few meetings repeatedly, because we becoming increasingly concerned that those spaces are becoming uh, fewer and fewer. And um, I think it's becoming a little bit more urgent for the planning board, at least some of us, to become a little bit more protective of it, precisely because it comes up 
regularly and there's always a reason why maybe it's not okay here or it is okay here but not in the future so i think the future is here uh, we need to be a little bit more concerned about um, the spaces that we have and so i think georgie brought up that specific issue in a way that i think everybody should be able to understand um, because having that uh, definition of industrial as office i think um, we we already seen what may may very likely happen unless there are restrictions or some um, guidelines set in place. Uh, I, I think that that's something that I think the developers as well as the city needs to kind of um, um, see our perspective, I hope, because seriously from the, from as a planning board member, we try to look in the long range development of the city. And we are being having this um, challenge of grappling with individual projects that oftentimes don't necessarily contribute to the vision that we want for the city and that our citizens want and have for the city. So at some point, somebody has to do the hard work or the painful work. And so I, I, I just want to be you know, clear about it. This is a very par, um, difficult piece to agree with because I don't think it takes us in the direction that our city needs to go. And that is not even counting with Mark just talked about with regards to um, our real challenges with climate change, which as you know, we're living in right now. Yes, Great. I hope that's clear enough. So I think it, it, in my perspective, from my point of view, um, it's, it's hard to uh, support the plan use as it's coming right now, unless there's some clear guidelines um, but I think that's enough. Okay, thanks Lupita. All right, um, Sarah and then Alex. Okay, um, uh, so not surprisingly, I have like a three page treatise that I wrote out that I'm gonna try to um, get down to the nubbins. Um, I will start with um, any proposal that includes the following statement should be seriously reconsidered. And this is a quote from our own, our, this project. Mixed use industrial neighborhoods are not common in the United States. There are a few places in the world that have successfully achieved integrating industrial and residential uses. These are typically separated and are considered incompatible due to conflicts over noise, potential smells or emissions, trucking and access among other issues. And yet this is what a huge swath of our land use redesignation proposes. I, I, I'm, I was really sort of stunned when I read, you know, this, th this quote from our staff pointing out that this has been, this doesn't work. And while I really appreciate the staff's idealism that it could work, I'm quite concerned that it will not work because it doesn't work. Um, and it points exactly to what George has said and what John has said and what Lupita has said about this mixing together of um, industrial, well, what we hope will be light industrial, but will likely be offices and residential. Uh, but we, so um, I wanna support everything George said. I wanna support everything John said. I wanna support everything Lupita said. And I, I wanna make a couple of other comments that haven't come up yet. Um, in this mixed use industrial um, framing, uh, you are. You have made the comment that um, the assumption is that we'll put a lot of permanently affordable housing in this industrial area, in these industrial areas. Um, I am not really clear why, at a time when we're talking about racial equity and environmental justice, we would be putting low and moderate income uh, residents into what we hope will be light industrial areas. That seems to me to have completely missed the point of, um, of these whole dis all these discussions about um, fighting racism and trying to address systemic racism. That's item number two. Item number three is a reiteration of what John said um, about missing middle, in this case, particularly forms. I was really surprised during our retreat when we were told by Jay Sugnut that our uh, missing middle strategy is a financial one and not one about form, but form matters. 
and um, we don't have we have very little between single family homes and high density residential and we have to we must try to figure out how to get more missing middle forms of housing into the city and the East Boulder sub community plan seemed to me to be an opportunity to do that. But in fact, we have only a few small spaces where that's proposed. Um, we need much more of those forms throughout the East Boulder sub community plan. Uh, and those forms should not be limited to middle income families. Those should also be for low and moderate income families. They also want to live in houses with yards or townhomes or cottage courts or whatever the form might be. Um, and I think this all comes back to this fundamental challenge of um, indus mixing industrial and residential. And I realize right now I'm in Washington DC and I've gone to see the whole, all the new funky areas that have been built and they are a mix of offices and residential, but they are all very high end. They are very high end. There is no affordable housing there and it is, an, it is absolute gentrification. It, and it's been going on for 20 years. So what's being proposed is not going to produce affordable housing. And it's, and it's it, we, we need to separate out as much as we can at the most granular level, that which will be industrial, that which will be office and that which will be residential. And we must do it because we also have a problem in this, in, in our use code, in our, I'm sorry, in our code, in which if, if an industrial zone touches a residential zone on one sixth of its uh, boundaries, it can become residential Residential is always a higher value than industrial, and we will just keep losing more and more industrial land. So, you know, there are many things, I, I know this is, you guys have been working really hard, and I think in some ways what this gets down to is the granularity question, but Boulder has not been all that great at about super granular when it comes to individual parcels. So we have pretty broad definitions. So this is, would require, you know, to use Kathleen's framing, really changing the rules. And, and I have a feeling that because this has been driven in, in because there's been a lot of, of voices from the development community and you even say in here, the change in the study is not likely to happen with greater entitlements. A big part of what's driving this is the idea of creating those greater entitlements. That should not be what's driving this. What should be driving this is what's in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And I am done, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, Alex, you're up. Yeah, having less experience with zoning and our land use tables, the visuals that you guys presented tonight really helped me develop an understanding of the land use typologies that I think you've been alluding to in the past. And I, that greatly under, helped my understanding. And I would imagine as you do public outreach, it'll be beneficial moving forward. I think the team's done a good job catering solutions that are unique for East Boulder um, working in the sensitivities of Boulder overall with the unique and changing land uses out there um, as things transition. So overall, yes, I am supportive of the land use plan. Uh, one big hope of mine would be that as redevelopment occurs, that access to that rely more on structured parking than surface lots or free on-street parking. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, and if Hutch is back, um, we can circle back and let him have a chance. Oh, if he goes on, I'll stop sharing my thingy. Hutch, if you're here and would like to speak to this, um, you can just unmute. But if not, um, we'll keep going and we'll keep trying to rope you in in the next, in the next round. Great, thanks everybody. Um, really um, let me ask this: Did um, did uh, we want to have time for uh, any any of the things that came up to be addressed by the presenters, or should we keep going uh, and and do that at the end? How how, how were you all thinking? Did, did you want to say anything, or did, should we just keep going through the feedback at this point? Um, I th I think the feedback has all been super super helpful. Um, I'm looking back through my notes, you, you know, the only thing I want to make sure that it's not 
um, misunderstood or mischaracterized is the idea that we are um, locating uh, locating affordable housing in industrial neighborhoods um, intentionally as a way to produce that affordability. Um, I don't, I would not say that's our approach. Um, our approach is um, providing a diverse mix of housing types in mixed use neighborhoods to create 15 minute neighborhoods. So I just wanna make sure that that's not um, misunderstood. If I can respond to that, I, I was not saying that you're putting them in light industrial areas in order to make them affordable, but you very clearly state a priority of innovative mixed uses, ample residential residential options admits the light industrial, especially affordable housing. So it's I'm it's it's I'm I'm responding to what's in the report. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Great. Well, then I'll go ahead and uh, with the corrected spelling, spin the wheel for the next round. And the winner is, oh, I'm going to have to spin twice because it's going to be Georgie again. Yeah, no, we, we, we said we don't get to go to, you don't get to go first twice. Uh, oh, now it says it's Tila. Apparently, oh, okay. okay, there we go. All so, right. I got confetti too, didn't I? Yeah, you get confetti. <laughs> let me i'm sure okay okay so so this is the connections plan correct question yes uh in general i do support the uh the the proposed connections plan um i i this is kind of where i was parking my thoughts uh, similar to what mark had said about um trying to be impactful uh and really this is a, a large chunk um, and an evolving chunk in a place to really change how we are approaching, um, how we think about the city and how, how people should be getting around or not getting around or what they should be expecting of their streets because we have a chance here in certain places to just build it fresh. Um, at the same time, I think some of the things in the connections plan, especially the, um, the enhancements that were uh, shown highlight um, places where we have not in the past adequately thought about connectivity with different modes. Um, so for instance, like the, one of the enhancements, and I, and I recognize Jean said it was a work in progress, but um, was better signposting between uh, the multi-use path along South Boulder Creek and the Flatiron Business Park um, because uh, there's there's very little connectivity now. It's kind of long been on on the books as maybe hoping for one or two connections, um, and those are very essential connections because today um, people not in motor vehicles and not in trucks are scared off of Fifty Fifth Street, and so this is the only way for them to access that section. And we've done a poor job of doing it. And the fact that we need to put signage on the one existing connection, which looks like you're doing the wrong thing. It's a, uh, right, you, the, these, the cyclists are left with the absolute dregs. It's a drainage ditch, people, which must mean it floods during bad conditions. And this is the only connection we've managed to build so far. That is a far cry from um, what I see as the aspirational tone throughout this document about having, you know, flexible connections and, and connecting multimodal um, and, and all these micro mobility devices. Um, in the new places, um, you know, the corner between Valmont and 47th and Pearl, like great. That looks nice and permeable. Same thing with uh, the station area, really permeable by these smaller modes, but it highlights to me that we have failed uh, on some of our existing infrastructure. And I would really like to see more attention paid to um, fixing those past mistakes, uh, in, in particular connecting to some of these office parks um, or to the Flatirons Business Park more, um, more directly, more welcoming, <laughs> um, and more feasibly. So, um, and that highlights a, another, I'm not quite clear on whether we are treating this as a 20 year um, planning horizon 
when Jean also says we're looking to uh, rethink how we do the TMP because the next TMP update is gonna come much sooner than that. And in particular, I'm hoping that, and this is the same street I, I talked about at our last joint meeting, 55th Street is a huge barrier. It's a highway, a de facto highway. And I can understand how it happened that way. It was kind of on the edge of town before, um, but it is an untamed beast. And I don't see enough uh, effort right now in this connections plan to tame that particular beast. Again, with the, with the new sections that we're building new connections and new roadways, they look lovely. Um, I think that the variety of kinds of roadways and the different names are a little bit unnecessary, but uh, it all tends to just um, obscure the fact that we have a many headed hydra running right through this plan and it's called 55th Street. And just to say, we recommend a, a, um, a corridor study for it to fix it and make it a complete street at some unknown point in the future is deeply unsatisfying. Uh, so I'm hoping to rethink 55th Street sooner. Uh, it should operate more like, you know, a, a, a definitely um, a corridor, definitely um, a, an arterial roadway, but not the scary thing that it is now, because there's no reason to think that this micro mobility pilot that we're about to start is going to go well. Um, I think my last comment is that the focus, focus on micro mobility fleets and these um, transit hubs, these mini transit hubs, pretty interesting thought. I believe that they tend to overlook the use of privately owned micromobility devices that we're already seeing on our streets. And so to focus on them as being part of a B-cycle fleet or you know, part of a city of Boulder sponsored program um, is overlooking the fact that they are revolutionary, they're affordable, they are on the streets now, they are coming, there's a massive uh, influx of inventive power going into making the, the um, batteries for such devices better for making them usable for different kinds of users with different levels of ability. Uh, and so to say that um, they're gonna be prioritized on one or two little streets on the, on the corners is again, highlighting our failure to accommodate them and, con and connect them using our existing multi-use path network or our, our arterial roadways where they're scared off now. So I think that we should be focusing as a much more um, urgent matter on bigger changes that will lead us to bigger impacts toward our, um, say, greenhouse and climate initiatives um, as part of um, the, the connections plan because we're, we're letting the big beast go untamed right now. Great, and was I next, Jean? All right. I'm uh, wondering about the randomness of this wheel now. I'm sorry, we're almost in the same order. But anyway, uh, the, um, everything that Tila said, I agree with uh, uh, really great points. Um, I, um, I think I also, um, and it, we're, we're still early in the plan. So I understand that the, a lot of this stuff is, is still gonna get worked out, but I don't wanna be too uh, conservative uh, with regards to transportation. Uh, um, if we, do put in more car circulation in places like the stamp area. Um, I'd like to make sure that they're really de-emphasized because that's not very many square blocks. And uh, so people can go 15 miles per hour or less and uh, if they're in a car or maybe maybe some of them don't need to be open to cars and uh, and really finding really envisioning how the pedestrians and the bikes, uh, enter and exit um, the very important places they need to go is important. So uh, just keep keep uh, thinking about all that circulation uh, from emphasizing uh, the the pedestrian and uh, uh, and uh, bike because with the transit core transit hub there, uh, we're our vision is to make it a lot more interesting and exciting to go without your single occupancy vehicle, right? So that that's the real priority is is to make sure that uh, that it's welcoming and easy for this new world because you know with the timeframes that we're talking about a lot of these shifts are really going to be happening by then so yeah sorry Jean you were muted but. Uh, uh, <laughs> I muted before I saw that. All right, great. Um, 
John Gerstel, you're up, and then Hutch, and then Mark. Okay. Well, uh, uh, I, I think uh, I, I agree a lot with what uh, David said uh, and Tila. Uh, the, the challenge here is not to be too conservative. But uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is that I'm, I'm very concerned with making this area as much a part of Boulder as possible. And right now it's to some degree isolated because of the Foothills Highway um, and uh, very few crossings of that highway. There's a, there's a couple of bike tunnels and a couple of intersections. And it serves to physically isolate this neighborhood from the rest of Boulder. And uh, I think that we should be uh, thinking about how we can do more to integrate it with more bike paths uh, can crossing the Foothills Highway, uh, for example, to, to make it more, more integrated. Uh, beyond that, I, I can just say I agree with David and Tila. Great. Thanks, John. Hutch, if you're here, you can take a turn and uh, unmute and speak. And if not, um, Mark, we'll get ready for you. Now's your time, connections. Well, I, I don't want to repeat what I said uh, mistakenly at the wrong time, uh, so I won't. Uh, but what I said about connections still stands. Uh, I, I just I wish I had a better map to help all of us plan to make real connections. And I think I, I wrote down something about um, identifying those gaps, and I think that's where a lot of this this work is going. Okay. Um, Lupita, then Sarah, then Alex. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add about this. I, I think that some of the people have brought some more important points. Um, I didn't get to speak before, and but uh, Sarah did bring up something regarding equity. Um, that was part of my questions um, earlier on my list, just in terms of making sure that some of the uh, proposals we see going forward, we are more deliberate in the way that we treat, um, you know, especially in this area where we do have enclaves of some of our, our uh, more vulnerable com um, communities, where I think it would be a good opportunity to um, include in this development uh, elements that integrate this usually um, disconnected communities. And so uh, in the you know breaking of rules, that would be one that I would like to see broken, one where we do not segregate the other, but integrate the other. And so, that, that, that will make it, um, I think, um, it, whether it's we're going through the transportation piece, how do we know that what we're proposing will serve the needs of some of our communities within the city of Boulder that maybe uh, will not be able to afford a electric vehicle, for example. just as a point of reference. Great. Thank you, Lupita. Okay, um, Sarah, Alex, and then George. So I'll just, I support what has been said before um, and we'll add just one thought, which is um, some of the micro mobility stuff, um, which are really interesting ideas and obviously already rolling out both in Boulder and across the many places across the country aren't necessarily, um, uh, utilize, can't, can't necessarily be utilized by families. Um, and we have to make sure that we figure out the first and last mile for people who are, who might have one or two children with them or an elderly relative or, ha, you know, is coming back from the grocery store and doesn't have a car, isn't going to use a scooter or a e-bike. Um, and so we just need to keep that in mind. Thanks, Sarah. 
Okay, um, Alex and then George. I think this plan does a really good job of, of building a grid where there isn't one today. And that's really important for uh, easing pressure on the nearby arterial streets and creating a more walkable area. I think the network as shown supports the proposed land uses. It's rooted in best practices. And I feel like it's doing so without any planned extravagance or grand expenditures, which is something I don't think we always achieve when we're doing visioning exercises. So I think that was really well done. Tila mentioned earlier the importance of 55th Street. We have very few north-south arterials in town and they're very vital for uh, people cycling and walking. And so it, the, that will be a, a critical um, next step after we, we've looked at Arapahoe, but we need to take a closer look at 55th, which I see is called out for a future corridor study in both this and in the TMP. Uh, one nitpick within the current draft is the rendering for 55th Street, I think as a retrofit accomplishes a little, but it's not all that imaginative or rooted in best practices for what we'd want to see if we were to rebuild 55th. It just shows a little paint and some flex posts. And if we were to reconstruct that street, if we wanted it to align with best practices for safety, we would want to reconstruct it with a little uh, safer facilities back of curb for people walking and biking. Um, I hope to see the lowest low cost opportunities really called out in the 90% the draft of this in the implementation section. Uh, by shining a light on those, I think it'll be easier for transportation and mobility to insert those into upcoming CIPs uh, where appropriate. And one area I see an opportunity for coordination is uh, it seems like we're about 10 years away from rebuilding East Arapaho, at least that's what transportation leadership has indicated to me. And so we could see some redevelopment in the area before then. And the placement of transit stops is something that I think should be coordinated with redevelopment. And it could also be coordinated with our upcoming East Arapaho multi-use path project, where we're gonna rebuild some of the bus stops out there. And so if we were able to determine the ideal stop spacing and the placement of those stops, we could determine if some of those we that are out there today, we wanna remove them. And so there's no need to um, upgrade them right now. Or if there's one that we wanna be, that we want placed in front of a future development that that developer knows uh, that we wanna do that. So I think taking a look at stop spacing and the specific placement sooner than later could benefit both this effort and that project. Um, overall support of, of this network and think it could be best communicated with a single map that shows not just the projects that have come up through this effort, but overlays those on top of the already planned TMP projects. Perhaps it could differentiate between the two, but seeing that total network, I think would help um, the community develop a better understanding of what you're trying to construct out there. Thanks. Great, thanks, Alex. Okay, and George? I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a lot of commentary on the actual um, plan itself outside of sort of how the land use marries with what's proposed. Um, my, my biggest concern is that it is, is to mitigate um, uh, you know, in commuting um, and with the, the, the land use as it currently stands. I don't know. I don't I'd like to understand the data around sort of this plan, kind of kind of what Mark had said um, in, in your first set of comments, Mark. I thought that was really interesting and enlightened around um, just trying to understand all the data of how we're getting people off the road, how we're how we're how we're meeting our climate change goals, um, and I think that goes hand in hand with with the land use and making sure that we don't have a jobs housing imbalance here. And so that's. Those would be my sort of 30,000 foot comments. Thank you. Great, thanks, George. Okay, um, I think we are, we are through the list for this question. Um, Dave, do you wanna spin again? You're muted. Okay, 
Dave, if you can unmute. Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, it, it came up with Alex. Hopefully you're okay. ready for that. Alex, are you ready to jump back in? So um, the third question is around the recommendations for the 55th and Arapaho station area. Sure, I don't think I have a whole lot to add, but uh, in addition to what I said about land use and the connections plan, uh, one thought, I guess, is uh, throughout Boulder, what, a lot, what motivates a lot of our decisions is preserving uh, views of mountains or providing access to open space. And I think one underutilized thing we, we, ha we don't do enough of is provide public access to rooftops. Uh, seeing the success of Avanti downtown, the longer waits for a table at the rooftop of the Rio, the public space on top of the side of the former Daily Cameron building, I think it'd be good to integrate some sort of, uh, either it's a public space or just uh, places where customers have access to a place with, with great views. And perhaps the, the best place to do that would be in the vicinity of the, the station at 55th. Great, thank you. Okay, and then up to George and then Tila and then Dave. Can you repeat the question for me one more time? I think I understand them, but I just want to... Uh, do you support the proposed concept for the 55th and Arapaho station area? So I, it, I think my comments for, for the first question are the same here. Um, so maybe you can just ditto me for, mm -hmm. for question one. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Georgie. Okay, Tila and then Dave. Okay, I forgot to, I'm in the wrong spot. Um, I, with the caveat that, as Mark said, I guarantee what you see here is not what's going to get built. <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to nitpick. Um, in general, I really, really like what I see here. Uh, and let me tell you a couple of things that I do like about it as, as just things I'm hoping will, will remain. Um, I, I love the obvious permeability. Um, throughout the site, the cross um, plazas, um, the places that people are likely going to be able to access on foot um, and probably going to choose as walking paths on foot or on bikes. Uh, and I like that there's an understanding that pedestrians and cyclists and other micromobility um, modes will be using those things. Uh, as I mentioned before, I thought um, having these four different flavors of streets was a little bit much. I thought it was just too much categorization and not necessary. And in particular, I really liked the idea of the activation street on Conestoga Court. Um, if, if, uh, if I'm understanding it right, it would kind of operate and feel like that main street in the 29th Street Mall. Not that I like the 29th Street Mall that much, but that seemed to be the kind of thing that you were going for. Um, and I thought that just, you know, three or two blocks long on one axis was maybe a little too little. And so I'm curious about making it more of a district uh, and having one of the intersecting streets, the yellow residential street that's I think unnamed um, on the area master plan concepts. I'm looking at page uh, 103 out of 199 in the packet. Um, but trying to have more than just one activation street um, would help create a feel of, of, a, of a kind of a, a general area to be instead of just the one, one spot to be and instead of clustering everything all in one, one drag. Um, the, I had one more thought on this. Oh, I appreciated the, uh, the plan multi-use paths and trying to uh, integrate those. Again, this is uh, trying to avoid some of the mistakes that we've had um, that I talked about my last, my last little rant, um, because I think that this is helping to, to integrate multi-use path access across the site and the, you know, to kind of pinpoint um, when people are on smaller devices to pinpoint where they wanna be, they'll have the ability to kind of go right there. And I really like that. One other thing that I really like about this is you've tried to create a grid, um, but in clear spots, you have offset some of the intersections so that it doesn't necessarily look like a grid from the road user's perspective. It kind of keeps um, all users of the road, but in particular, the motor vehicle users sort of a little bit more attuned to what's closer to them and what's right in front of them because they don't have that, you know, 2000 
you know, quarter mile view um, because they, they'll just have to navigate these things. And that all of that kind of um, participates in creating a sense of space where you have to be more cognizant of smaller people around you, more cognizant of the nearer area and drive slower. And um, that's, that's really good. So I understand it might not you know, end up being this final alignment, but those kinds of tricks are really great. I note them and I applaud that. Uh, the final thing that I really liked about it was planning for heavy vehicles uh, and routing for them instead of making the large you know, semi truck that's delivering stuff, um, sort of the default design vehicle for all of these streets. I think actually making it difficult for such large vehicles on some of the streets would be um, a, a, a desirable thing to do, um, to route some of the heavier, slower, lumbering, noisier, crappier traffic um, kind of on the perimeter, uh, I think is a, is a wise move and something that we should be trying to do elsewhere in the city. Lots of cities have designated truck routes. We don't in particular, um, but where we're envisioning something like this with a lot of large transit vehicles and trying to um, concentrate some industrial and some you know, uh, retail uses and things that will have some of this kind of traffic to not say it all goes everywhere all the time, but to say certain times and places it's more appropriate. I think you can accomplish with, with road designs like this. Um, I think that's about all I have. I really liked the uh, pedestrian bike emergency access street and I was kind of bummed it was just relegated to one edge. I understand why, but um, if, if, you could, if we could see more of that, I would love to see more of that. That's all I have, thanks. Great, thanks Tila. Okay, um, Hutch, welcome back. And we'll circle, we'll circle you in in just a minute um, after a few other folks and give you time and space to answer any of the questions that you'd like um, since we missed your comments on land use and connections as well. Right now we're uh, providing comments on the 55th and, Arapaho, 55th and Arapaho Station Area Master Plan. Okay, so I have Dave, John, and then Hutch. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, um, I, I really love the comments that have been said so far. Um, I think that uh, I, um, I, I agree with Tila's comments on, on transportation completely. Um, so I won't repeat any of those. Um, I love the plazas on the concept and I'm hoping that the outcomes can really, uh, really have a lot of these smaller kind of places where people gather outdoors. Um, it really makes for some, some fabulous places. So uh, that, that's really a great concept. One thing that strikes me at looking at this uh, area that's going to be a challenge, and I want to acknowledge it, is that um, there are currently a lot of very uh, beloved uh, little restaurants and shops in along uh, Arapaho there that, uh, you know, th and this changes that uh, segment pretty drastically. So um, I think the public's going to be a little bit nervous about losing their, is it Pico um, Mexican restaurant or their um, I, I think maybe Black Belly fits in. Fits in so, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things there that um, there's an Indian restaurant. There's a lot of uh, nice businesses, and people are going to want to see an evolution that won't cause us to feel like we're losing uh, our personality. Um, but I think it's the right thing to do in a transit corridor. So um, hopefully, we can find ways to do it smoothly. Um, it is a little bit asymmetrical. Um, the south side being so close to residential, I see that we've gone with uh, lower um, building forms uh, to try to kind of taper down to residential, which <clears throat> is a little unfortunate, but I guess um, that can't be helped because we don't want to put the taller buildings too close to the residential neighborhoods. But I would just kind of try to see if we can, you know, see how we can kind of make the north and the south side of Arapaho uh, somewhat feel compatible uh, with that challenge, knowing that we do have that challenge that the South side gets closer to existing residential. And um, I'll um, just take the opportunity to then reiterate one more time that I'm hoping that some of these concerns with things like housing types and, and mix of uses uh, can be ironed out so that we don't have quite so much um, reluctance because I, I do think that, uh, that there are opportunities once you get a little further down into the zoning designations to address some of that. Thanks, Dave. Okay, um, John and then Hutch. Well, uh, thank you. I, uh, I agree with uh, most of, of what I've heard on this topic. In general, the, I have no major problems with the physical 
uh, layout that is proposed here, both in terms of streets and, uh, and buildings in general. But my concern is once again, the classification of mixed use and what, what the ultimate uh, fate of that will be given our experience. And so uh, I would say my, my comments again, as I mentioned previously, to, uh, to the concern with not the physical form, but the uh, use that is allowed in these buildings and to assure that uh, it will continue to be a place where service industrial can actually be found rather than just be permitted and, and yet not found there. Uh, I, I wanna keep a tire store and a garage available to us in Boulder. And this is the area where it's most likely to be possible unless we make it impossible by our activities today. Thanks. Thanks, John. Okay, Hutch, um, welcome back. Hope you're doing, hope you're feeling all Thanks. right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't have the staying power for the whole thing at the moment because uh, uh, I, I, th I think I can stay one hour less than the number of damaged ribs at the moment, but th thanks for uh, letting me come and go. And uh, if I make faces, it's not because of anything that's going on with the content of the meeting. Um, I, I only have two comments and they both reflect the things that just came up uh, and the others. One is I'm resonating very much with, with what John said that I, I, I think that unless we take some care, uh, the economics of an improved offer will make certain types of things unavailable, and and I think we have to think about what sort of what sort of structures enable that. You know, it's it, uh, it, it's almost as if Boulder needs a slightly shoddy uh, zone somewhere <laughs> where certain things can happen and where. Uh, you know, the artistic types can, you know, feel more at home or whatever. And I, I don't know what to, what to do about that thought in the planning guys, uh, but because the reality, as soon as there's much in the way of amenities, uh, amenities are always scarce. Uh, everything gets bid up. And, and so it, it's almost as if uh, my, my wish is that within the overall area, since this is sort of our playground zone a little bit more than other parts of town. Uh, we, we might even think in terms of sequencing, you know, okay, th th this, this bit, it really is, it's time to get improved. You know, these buildings are just about to fall down and, you know, things are a mess here and these streets are a disaster and there's safety problems here and there. And, uh, but over, over there, we'll let go into genteel decay a little more before we do something. So th that, that's more a philosophical point. Uh, but uh, I, I think the hard point in this is that there, there may be things that we do, do kind of th that, that actually do affect the phasing of what happens where uh, and, and what uh, genuinely uh, can, can benefit from these things. And I like what all these plans look like, believe me, it looks great. Um, uh, so, so that's that's one topic, and I, I think the other the other topic is that uh, although, although I agree with uh, somebody else, I, I think it was somebody on the staff that said, look, uh, the, this as as we do this planning, transportation is sort of the service element, but there there are ways in which when when things are very very when when they become multimodal destinations in particular. As soon as there's a decent number of people hanging around, stuff springs up as long as there is some flexibility of the spaces to be allowed to spring up. And so uh, the, the, the transportation stuff will drive some of the organic stuff. And I'm not quite sure where that happens, but I do have my hopes around that 55th area that I think there's enough goodies that you guys are thinking about there where that could be one of the things where just the patterns of where people are going to do some walking. And to me, the key is always walking. As soon as people are walking, you have a different interactive construct. You know, you can nose into something when you're walking. You can't nose into something when you're even pushing your bike. You know, figure out where to put the bike or whatever. Uh, but we're, we're basically creating a mini walkable neighborhood there, or at least parts of it, which means that parts of it 
need to have those capabilities of, of then putting in place uh, those niche and service businesses that are, that are amenable to higher traffic. And I didn't, I'm, I'm not a planning guy, so I don't know how that, how and when that fits into this whole process, but the interplay between the transportation, particularly the walking element, including, you know, when you get off your bike or your scooter or your micro mobility vehicle, uh, the, the walking thing actually drives that, you know, and, and as, as soon as you have a high walkability neighborhood, you know, the data's in, you know, the value goes up a lot. So don't try to put any low rent stuff right there in the high walkability bit. It's not going to last. It's going to go high rent whether you want it to or not. So those are my two reactions on a high level. Thanks, Hutch. Um, appreciate you hanging in here um, with us. All right, um, Mark and then Lupita. So, so I don't, I don't have much on the um, transit hub. I, I will say that the idea of smaller, more frequent transit hubs is, is mobility hubs uh, is is like smaller, frequent more frequent buses, it's, it, it, it makes things work a lot better for people. I, I do wanna emphasize that at 55th and Arapahoe, that the two um, uh, BRT stations slash mobility hubs need to be fleshed out with curbside management for shared vehicle, for Uber, Lyft, not that I'm an advocate of them, but, but just let's just acknowledge that um, there may be, there will be times where people uh, get off the bus and into a uh, shared vehicle, onto a shared bike, onto a shared scooter, um, uh, any, any number of things. But so I would really like to see those uh, designed and fleshed out as, as true little mini uh, transit stations. And I think the success in the before times of the new transit station um, uh, at Pearl and uh, 33rd, you know, that was quite successful until everything went to hell. So anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm excited by this whole concept and, uh, and the more frequent location, one block, another block uh, that, that a user can walk, uh, a business user. I would like to see this as something that an out of town business user could end a business meeting, walk out uh, with their briefcase, jump on a scooter, go to the 55th and Arapahoe BRT, um, catch the bus east to the Holiday Inn in Lafayette or wherever they're, else they're going and, and just skip the rental car. Uh, that I think in the future, we're gonna see that sort of thing if we have these kind of accommodations for them. That's it. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Lupita and then Sarah. And then I think we are circled. So, I appreciate Mark making the comments about the 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 visual mental vision that he sees. Uh, you know that will be using the space because I was kind of going in another extreme because that's really talking about you know like a business person and what they will do here and, and leaving the town when I was on the on the other extreme about you know how can we make sure or I will uh, encourage. Uh, the developers in our in our city uh, to look at this space and how we can serve our families uh, that are already here. And so the envisioning of a scooter, I have a hard time thinking about a family being served that way. So I would like to expand that vision to include some of the other demographics, you know, uh, or or family types or resident citizens that are in uh, in our city. So that that will be something that I would like to see more of. Uh, so one is about how do we serve our our uh, families, and I like it to be in a more deliberate and explicit ways, um, so that I can all have that vision as well. And also with regards to um, what could be done to serve our uh, sizable and highly esteemed uh, nonprofit and uh, artistic sector in this community. You know, we haven't spoke about this. this is a good opportunity where we can also do tremendous uh, uh, good for the city uh, and their vision, but uh, uh, focusing on some of these groups that are a vital and important um, 
I mean, vibrant part of our city that we don't often talk about. So I just wanted to bring those back into the discussion so that our vision becomes a little bit more comprehensive. Great, thanks Lupita. Okay, and Sarah, you can round thanks, us Lupita. off. Thanks Lupita, you stole what I was gonna say. Um, ah. I, I think this would actually be the perfect place for the kind of uh, public pri uh, arts and culture center that you've heard the planning board propose as a way to address some of the community benefits phase two conversation. Um, because if you were able to build such a thing here, it would be a destination point for people, not only from Boulder, but people east of Boulder. So I just wanna agree with Lupita that I think you should be planning that into uh, this area. Now that said, I have some other comments I'd like to make. Um, if I, under, if I read the material correctly, essentially the intensity level of development in this area would be similar to Transit Village, um, which is very intense. And I'd like to make sure that uh, we correct some of the mistakes that I think were made in Transit Village. Um, first and foremost, trees. Uh, Transit Village does not have enough trees. It's extremely, uh, I guess urban is the right term, but it, it lacks, it's like this, you walk into Transit Village and it's a neighborhood unlike any other neighborhood in Boulder. It's, there's not a lot of green, not a lot of trees, very uninviting and kind of broiling hot um, and lots of canyons. And I think you wanna get away from that. So more trees. Um, I, off of what Alex said, I'd like to talk about the opportunity for green roofs um, and that that's another way to utilize um, some of that space. Um, in terms of uh, the place types that you've proposed, to be honest with you, they all looked like various iterations of the same idea. And um, they were hard to distinguish. And I would, I would urge you all to try to be much more clear about the differences. Um, it all looked sort of exactly like what you would expect from, um, it, it kind of looked like uh, high-end America, USA. I mean, all kind of look the same and uh, with, you know, garage doors and anyway. So I would urge you to really try to differentiate what each of those place types is really, what's really unique about each of those place types. Um, I, uh, I also want to talk about form-based code, which was only mentioned briefly by Kathleen, but clearly form-based code is going to be part of the conversation for this area. Form-based code is solely about uh, making development go faster, which is fine, um, but it has nothing to do with affordability and affordability is our problem, um, not design. Although design might be the thing that gets people interested in talking about projects in Boulder, affordability is our issue. Um, we need to figure out how to make sure that we have um, on-site affordability in this area. And I would actually suggest that we contemplate a higher level than 25% of permanent affordability in this area. Um, if we wanna make Mark McIntyre's idea of the, the bike repair guy actually being able to live near his bike repair shop, the only way that's gonna happen is if we have enough um, permanently affordable housing that he can either rent or buy. And um, we have gotta go higher than 25%, I think in this area. Um, I, um, just as a just point of disagreement um, with David, uh, I think it's very important that we we lower the height near the residential. I mean, he didn't say not to do it. I'm not disappointed with the idea that we're lowering the height near the existing single family homes that are that back up to the southern this southern extension that we have added, even though it's outside the boundaries of the East Boulder sub community plan. Um, that area behind there is actually small single family homes on small plots. They're the kind of single family homes that even a density advocate could think are great. Um, and I wouldn't want, it to, wouldn't want us to um, create um, uh, a conflict with that neighborhood. Um, and uh, I guess I have a question, which is really how would the actual station be paid for? <laughs> like, I, I guess I'm not really clear how uh, where the funds for um, something that's a um, a place would be paid for. 
Um, I might ask Jean Sanson or um, Jay Rankin to talk about um, our, our concepts around the district and um, implementation for the uh, stations. Yeah, Jean, do you want to speak to the BRT improvements first? Yeah, I can speak to the physical <clears throat> BRT improvements and the phasing and timing of that particular project. So um, we're still in the very early stages of designing the BRT system for Arapaho. Um, next year, we will be initiating a project in coordination with the Colorado Department of Transportation. It is a state highway. Um, to move from the concept plan that we had in the East Arapaho transportation plan to a preliminary engineering design, which would include the actual design of the station. And when I say the station, I do mean the bus platform. So the bus platform and the amenities that we would want to see at those bus platforms. Um, and then we have to go out and get funding for that. So um, RTD doesn't have a heck of a lot of funding at the moment. Um, <laughs> we um, have seen, we are going to see a big infusion of money through the state with Senate Bill 260 passing and our largest transportation funding bill um, getting signed by the governor. So, you know, I am optimistic that there will be funding opportunities to not just build the platforms themselves, but also to um, find the funds to operate, um, to purchase and operate the vehicles for the BRT system. Um, and then as that relates to sort of the other types of amenities we would want to see at that particular station or bus platform, I'll let Jay speak to um, some of the conversations we've had about how to move those mobility hubs forward. Yeah, so the um, kind of the bigger idea would be, and I think Rachel maybe alluded to it earlier, but a district. Uh, designation and so there's a lot of different types of districts um, that can be put into place in the state of Colorado. Um, metro districts are a frequent one for a large scale redevelopment, but there's also general improvement districts and uh, all other flavors. And so the idea would be that there would be, um, uh, or the the purpose of the district would be that um, as part of the development and part of the development fees. Um, that we would look at parking. Um, so parking management is one aspect. So it could be actually looking at shared parking opportunities now that would open up some of the existing surface parking for redevelopment. Long-term, ideally, some sort of structured parking that would have a public purpose. Um, and again, with TDM and or transportation demand management and all sorts of things to reduce the overall demand for parking as well, but understanding that you know people are still gonna drive here sometimes. Um, other aspects though would be the placemaking, which I think you were asking about, uh, Sarah. So um, those would be plazas, um, enhanced streetscapes. And with that could also be programming. Um, and one of the other ideas that we had um, that we're investigating still and kind of seeing what the kind of market economics might be able to support, because um, you can only extract so much, but is some sort of um, maybe master uh, lease or management of the ground floor space too, at least in certain areas um, to actually facilitate, you know, the curation of what like you were talking about artist space and spaces and things like that, that the market might not bear naturally. So, so those would be the kind of the four big pieces that we're exploring as part of a district. Great. So, Jean, are we now going to go on to a presentation on the fall engagement window? It looks like Mark's got a hand up. I think there might be one more question. And then I just oh. want to do a quick time check of if folks need a, a stretch minute before we yeah. jump into this last one or if we should just power on. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to, uh, Sarah, the Transportation Advisory Board has been advocating that parking in the public right-of-way not only be uh, desubsidized, but that we make money from it to use for TBM products like mobility hubs, like uh, you know, incentives to get people out of their car. And that's something that we, we failed in doing that. But uh, right now, transport parking, and in the near term future, parking doesn't pay for itself, uh, doesn't pay for the administration of it, much less actually provide funds. But TAB has been quite 
vocal and, and, and strong advocates that uh, we should be making money from parking for doing exactly what we want to do out here with transit and uh, other mobility improvements. If I can just respond to that, I appreciate that that's something you all are pushing for, but it always has to be done within the context of um, addressing the needs of low and moderate income families and uh, the not just their economic needs, but many of those families, their cars are their business. And um, <clears throat> We have, this is something that we've seen with Ponderosa and other uh, uh, low moderate income developments. And it's just, it's never as simple as let's just slap a $50 something or a hundred dollars something right. or let's get rid of parking. So I appreciate well, that you all are pushing for that. And I appreciate you bringing it up and it's always this right. balance. We, but when we charge $17 a year for a 200 square foot parking space on Mapleton Hill. And that doesn't cover the cost of actually issuing the permit to a homeowner who owns a four, five, six, ten million dollar home on Mapleton Hill and we charge them $17 a year. Anyway, we're off on a different subject, but uh, I would love to pick this up with you, but sure there are equity concerns as well. Absolutely. And, and I'll just point out that both of our boards had a chance recently to weigh in on parking uh, in great detail. And I know I heard a lot of these points made. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> great. So, uh, Gene, did you, um, why don't we go ahead and um, give people like a, uh, just a three minute bio break and then uh, we'll be back at, uh, by 10 after at the latest. Is that okay? That sounds great. We're going a little bit longer than we had hoped, but lot to talk about here. So yeah, Gene, I forgot when you uh, share your screen, you have to hit the button twice. And so I had spun the wheel without displaying last time, but oh well, next time. It's always fun for people to watch you sit and talk when they can't hear the thing you're saying.
All right, hopefully people are getting ready to come back on. There's Sarah, thank you. Kathleen, I'm gonna ask if you can go ahead and share the um, slides for this. Good. Yes, I definitely can. Do we think everybody's back? Are we ready? Looks like we're getting there. Let's see. People could um, turn on your video just to signal to us you're ready. We'll get going. David, it's Tila. I'm back, but I'm not going to have my video on for just a minute. No problem. Great. Okay. Thank you for weighing in. So. This for Georgie, Lupita, are you okay with going forward? Well, Kathleen, why don't we just kind of do a slow roll forward and uh, hopefully they'll get on since we're a couple minutes past 9, 10. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I think, you know, the the um, previous conversation and, and people's thoughts around um, the land use plan and connections plan and concepts for for um, 55th and Arapahoe gave a lot of insight into um, what you might be looking for um, in community reactions and responses to um, the, these ideas and, and proposals um, as we move into our next big phase of engagement, which, um, as I described, is, is planned for this fall. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jean Gatza and let her describe our um, strategy for the fall engagement window. And um, we'll have a, a discussion about um, what you all hope to get out of that, that window. So go ahead, uh, Jean, and just give me a heads up when you want me to advance the slide. Yeah, you can go ahead and go on to the next one, Kathleen. That's a good point. I've um, Such a great conversation. I've been taking notes as we go about um, pieces of analysis that I think we're gonna to need to develop for the community engagement or some of the frequently asked questions and um, some of the uh, key messaging to, uh, to, to be able to help community, community members understand um, the benefits and impacts and, and rationale for a lot of these pieces. So um, the purpose of this next engagement window is really being in that home stretch to circle back uh, to, both ensure awareness uh, that the plan's happening and what the recommendations um, mean moving forward and to, and to, gather impact, uh, to gather feedback that will really help us truly refine um, and improve that final plan. Um, we're, I think we're gonna, we need to hear a lot more from the community about uh, prior, their priorities for the implementation pieces. Um, I think we've, we've heard about phasing in various comments tonight, and that will uh, that'll be important as we f as we continue to develop the implementation part of the plan as to what's most important to do in the near term and what would be in those mid or mid or long term piece uh, strategies. I do want to emphasize, and Kathleen, I think maybe it's the next slide. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and. Um, move ahead, I, I, I just wanted to say that in one of the, well, let me move to this one and I'll hit that in, in one of the next slides. 
um, we really want to build on this capacity that our community has, has demonstrated for virtual engagement. Um, citywide, this is this is a theme of um, our community has learned how to engage virtually and has come to really expect um, on demand inf you know, information that they can reach um, and understand and be able to participate um, at their convenience and not have to um, show up in person. Um, we will be targeting our engagement resources with the in-person event events um, to harder to reach populations or those populations where um, they really, um, it's, it's much harder to um, engage online or um, not as comfortable. Um, so we're gonna be working in that direction. We've definitely established great tools. I mean, we've, I thought we were really impressed with the community members in our last engagement window last winter, um, both the participation in the online events and the participation in the online questionnaires. Um, you know, just really great feedback. And um, we had some we had some really nice uh, work with the, especially our event. Well, I think two, two of the events um, where we had breakout groups that were led by our working group members and um, participated in the in each of those small conversations, as well as um, the event that we held in Spanish. Um, it was online and virtual, but um, we we um, were able to have some good conversations with those community members with that too. Um, let's see. So I think one of the key messages here is that we're not starting from scratch. We need to um, be able to demonstrate where the feedback that we've that people have given us already um, fits into this plan. And um, Kathleen, you can go ahead and move to the next one. Big picture, really, you know, are we on the right track? Is there is there something that's um, truly not in the direction that people want to go? One of the very intentional things that we asked in the last engagement window was um, around some of this tension that, that folks have talked about tonight about um, conversion of industrial land to into housing to potentially um, uh, add some of those housing types or forms that, that um, folks have talked about for the missing middle or um, lower low to moderate income. But the, I mean, the result of that is displacing some of the, the industrial, or is it emphasizing the industrial um, and adding some housing? And then there were questions about you know, mixed use. And so I was trying to um, pull up the reports from those just to refresh on some of those uh, feedback, the feedback that we got, but, uh, but the, the majority was around being really strategic um, about the changes and um, a lot of support for some mixed use areas. So um, I think that that's one of the things that we need to demonstrate is here's what we heard and here's how it's showing up. And are, is that what you meant um, with the feedback that you've given us? Our working group members have asked us to um, ask folks, you know, are, are we being visionary enough? Um, and I think that these, the comments that we've heard tonight um, align with that as well as what are some of the assurances and cautions that we can build into the plan to make sure that we're getting the things that we're intending. Um, you can move to the next one, Kathleen. And I think I mentioned this too. Um, diving deeper, some of the specifics, we're gonna, we're gonna wanna, uh, uh, um, there are gonna be some folks that are gonna really wanna dive into all of these place types and all of the detail, and we're gonna want that feedback from them to uh, refine and um, improve all of the, um, the specific details for the key recommendations around housing, local business, and um, implementation. So um, with that, it's um, building on what, we, what we've already heard and talked about tonight. I think um, it would be really helpful for us to have um, feedback from you around the types of things that would help you gain assurance that um, we, we've made the revisions in the plan and the plan reflects 
um, the vision that the community wants to see in East Boulder and meets the goals that we are committed to be to meeting from the comprehensive plan. Kathleen, anything else to add with that? Um, no, I think, you know, just I would mention we're planning for um, this engagement window to take place uh, in September and October. Um, we've got a variety of, of methods that we're going to be using. And so we'll be taking your, your input and feedback to, I think, um, first create the sort of educational materials that will supplement any type of questionnaire that we put out there, um, as well as um, develop your input will inform how we develop those questions and then analyze the feedback to deliver back to you when we come back with final recommendations um, towards the end of the year. But that's it. Great. Do folks have questions before we jump into comments? I see John's hand. Great. And I can help out with them. And I think uh, Tila, and did I see other than one more hand? Let's start with John. Yeah, thank you. So can you describe a, a little bit more how many public meetings? You mentioned that you would have a, a public in-person meeting or two, as well as online stuff. And in my opinion, the, the in-person meetings are extremely valuable and provide feedback that you don't get online. And so I'm just wondering how many in-person meetings you're, you're contemplating. Well, honestly, um, with the, our approach that we're, that we're thinking about and um, feel free to give us direction otherwise, um, as far as resources and staffing, um, we're really thinking about the, you know, the main um, engagement, the like overall citywide targeted engagement to still be virtual um, with an, a, an event or more um, and an online feedback form uh, forum on our Be Heard Boulder platform, um, but then targeting in-person events um, potentially with you know, very, you know, targeted populations. So we're thinking, you know, for sure about um, the San Lazaro, San Lazaro neighborhood um, and really focusing those to going to where people are, meeting people where they already are with the considerations of making sure that it's safe, um, feels right within our, co you know, COVID regulations and, and just in general of feeling like that's um, an okay way to gather. I think we have um, three events specific that would be in person. So um, one, as was mentioned, would be the San Lazaro um, community meeting. Um, and then two um, opportunities for property owners to come in, look at the maps, point at where their property is, talk about their concerns. Um, so th those are the, the three that we have planned right now. Okay. Um, I'll, we, I'll do my comments. Uh, react okay, Atila. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to point out, like as I mentioned earlier, there's a, been a ton of background work. Twenty four meetings, some in person, some virtual. I, I just want to do another nod to the amount of, of public outreach that has happened so far. Um, and so I've scanned those. I won't admit I've memorized them or read them carefully. Uh, but my question was uh, how much outreach to older adult populations has there been? Um, I have two, I have all four of my parents, you know, uh, in-laws and things all alive and they range in age from 72 to 85. And so we are in the midst of trying to figure out where people should live, their various levels of cognitive and physical decline. And it's really opened my eyes to um, the opportunities for a kind of uh, communal living situation that's not a retirement community. Some members of my family really don't wanna go into a retirement community, but would be open to going into an apartment uh, because there's you know, no landscaping to take care of. There's neighbors, there's elevators, that's all on one level, that kind of thing. 
Uh, and so the, the kind of smaller and affordable housing opportunities that I'm seeing, you know, glimmers of here would potentially be answer a lot of uh, questions. And, and, the, and the other thing on my mind is that Boulder, a, along with a lot of communities in the United States, is about to have an elder boom. Um, you know, the, the, the post-war generation is now getting into the age where they're going to need to do something other than living in their two or three level home with a lot of lawn. And I'm just wondering what kind of outreach or um, input you've received from that age group or that kind of community, bearing in mind, we're still looking 20 years out, um, but you know, how have we been pitching it or, or gathering feedback from that portion of the population? Well, I would say that um, in a lot of these conversations, the housing has really, the, the discussion about new housing has been geared toward those that work in that East Boulder area. So, you know, I don't think that we've emphasized a flavor of um, housing for older adults in this area necessarily, not to say that that um, some of these types wouldn't, wouldn't work for that. I know that um, in the transit village, um, a lot of that housing um, has been folks that wanted to downsize from single family homes because they're in retirement and want to move to one car. So I think that there's probably, um, you know, some opportunity of that, especially around that, the station area um, potential, but, um, but it's a really good point. And I think we do, um, we do typically hear from older adults in our citywide engagement. Um, but I would, I would welcome your thoughts on um, how to invite folks to this conversation, knowing that this is um, not just about senior, you know, for older adult housing, but really the, the, all of the dynamics that are happening in East Boulder. So I would welcome your, your thoughts on how we might do that. Well, when we were talking about uh, moving to virtual format, uh, you know, some some members of my family are really great at, at figuring out Zoom and some of them, there's no hope. <laughs> and so I, and I, and when you were speaking of hard to reach populations, that was a, a bit of a euphemism for, I'm not sure who you were talking about. And I was wondering about elder populations being some of those hard to reach uh, in a virtual format. And so I would kind of echo um, John's concern about going all virtual and trying to think about the different barriers in place for different mm -hmm. kinds of people um, and families uh, for whom a virtual format is quite difficult. Um, how do we reach them? Let me think more about that. I just wanted to know more about how, how hard we've tried to, to, to reach out to that segment of the population. We do, we do ask questions about um, age and demographics in our survey work. So we could you know, kind of look up that number and see how successful we've been in the past. Um, but the other thing, the other idea that I'm thinking about um, right now is we have a lot of um, medical facilities, um, medical services in this area. Um, and prior to COVID, we did um, have some in-person stations and kind of drop in um, at the hospital and around those neighborhoods. Restrictions are really different now, but I, it's probably, um, that area is probably, if we were to do something in person, um, a good kind of location. Right, so sort of man on the street intercept surveys might mm -hmm. work okay. You won't have to go into the building, but could be in the vicinity maybe. Mm -hmm. Hey, any more questions, Sarah? Well, it's not a question. I was ready to try to answer the questions that we were well, asking. Shall we, shall we do the question? Uh, uh, yes. yes. All right, let's do it. And let's go ahead and uh, I forgot to share last time. We'll spin the wheel just because it's so much fun to do. And the person who will start us off this time is Sarah. Oh, nope, I'm sorry, Hutch. Aww. But if Hutch isn't on, then Sarah. This Hutch may have uh, may have gone to take a break. The poor guy has been. Oh, I'm I'm here. I I am a little confused about what I'm supposed to do though. Well, we're going to give feedback now on the um, the public uh, outreach uh, plan for the fall. 
that we just uh, saw the presentation. Right, right, and and I I, I did see that. Um, it, my my I, I I always say the same thing about public outreach is is that you know are there ways to get a hold of people that don't normally give public outreach, <laughs> you know, and 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 sometimes there's some special category and sometimes they're not. Uh, I think that Boulder does a pretty darn good job of trying hard on this, I, and I, I don't have any particular insights into mechanisms uh, because of my personal background. I, I, I resonate with uh, some of the communities that Lupita, you might might also resonate with uh, the you know Spanish native language communities. So I'm really glad to see that we're doing materials in other languages. Uh, but I, I don't really have any explicit feedback that, feedback that I think is going to be helpful. I think we just keep trying. I, I guess I would just, I, I, if I could uh, quickly follow up with, um, um, certainly um, love to hear feedback about um, mechanisms and ways to reach different populations and the different demographics or communities that you want to hear from, um, but would also really love your feedback about um, what is the, the type of information or what is the um, content of the feedback that you'd like to see us come back with. Um, when we return towards the end of the year with some final recommendations. And Kathleen, I, I will add, um, it, it'll be super helpful to, to also take your, your suggestions back to our working group members. They are our, um, our wonderful conduit, and John, you're one of them, um, to help us get the word out and to help you know use their networks to help um, say, hey, this is going on, and this this um, this this meeting is going to be here. Come 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 to it, or here's this here's this questionnaire. Please um, fill it out. So um, we do have all of our wonderful champions um, to help us get the word out into um, very specifically our um, Spanish speaking community with our connectors that are on the working group, but then all of the others too. Okay, who's next? Um, did you want to go through in order, Jean, or shall we? Uh... Oh, we can. Um, I'm a little split brained right now. <laughs> um, okay, Hutch. So then um, if Hutch started, then we're on Mark and then Lupita and then Sarah. Um, I'll simply say that uh, I think um, while I miss our in, I miss many city in, in person meetings that we used to go to. Um, I have been pleasantly surprised with the accessibility of online meetings, and I know that it's, 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 it's accessible to those that have the tools to get online to come to our meeting, but it has, I, I do feel like for, for TAB, it has broadened uh, the ability for the public to participate rather than sitting in, in council chambers for waiting for a public hearing item. Anyway, I, I think it's broadened the participation. So I would advocate as the city goes to a hybrid model, I talked to Sarah Huntley the other day about what things look like going forward, that if, if you can do in-person meetings with online uh, accessibility, and I know it's a challenge, but if you can, I, I would advocate for that. Um, and then, on your slide where you, uh, it was entitled specifics and you had three lines there. Um, I would simply add, ask that you add one and that is how does every action, uh, I, and I hope this plan uh, develops into uh, concrete actions that can be taken. How does every action in this plan help us reach our climate goals? Um, and, and that needs to be, when, when you go through the plan and you read the, the different, uh, when you search for the word climate, it comes up many times, but there is, <laughs> it's, it comes up and it says climate and then the words below it don't really, don't really connect to our climate action plan at all. So I would, I would request that we um, 
put that into the specifics that the public gets to comment on. Okay, um, Lupita, then Sarah. Um, so I had some comments earlier and now I'm trying to go back to that space because it, it came naturally to me when you were speaking about uh, the reach out to the Latino community. And I, I know that we had a, a very effective um, program going on um, as the pandemic hit. And that was through outreach um, uh, outreach through the Catholic community, our specific uh, Sacred Heart of Jesus, where uh, we will have activities with the city, uh, and we call the uh, the program Conversaciones con la Ciudad, so chats with the city, and we have city council, and people like Sarah Huntley will come, and, um, and Ryan Hanson, and it was uh, very successful and getting good feedback and in many cases, um, you know, new ideas from the community telling us directly what they needed. And that was going really well. And unfortunately we stopped that. But in that context that I will offer that as a, um, a model that has worked to make sure that those communities feel comfortable. And in fact, in the past, um, we, we have this discussion earlier, I thought about another question regarding that is like making sure that you are getting you know, not only your message across to these communities, but you also get information from them. So when you actually tr have a true direction communication channel, uh, I think that that's when you really reach success. When you know that you are getting good ideas that were not on your list that came from these communities. Uh, that's what I call real success. Um, so if there's an opportunity for that, I, I offer that as an option because uh, at least um, uh, with Sacred Heart of Jesus, uh, church uh, services are going sort of back to normal. Um, some of us are still listening in the parking lot, but very few of us, most of the people are back in there, but certainly some of these activities are getting back in order. So if you're interested in that avenue, given that you know school is back in session, so uh, some of these things are a possibility, um, I'll, I'll be happy to kind of uh, help with that. Uh, uh, and um, what else was I going to say? Oh, yes. Uh, regarding the modality for um, um, information, um, another thing that we found with the city previous uh, initiatives with the Latino community in terms of providing information uh, to the community, they tried a text messaging program that apparently didn't go as far as we hoped for. But in the process, found out the Facebook book works fairly well. It's interesting, I just found that for a project I'm involved in Puerto Rico, where we're doing uh, for research purposes, also using Facebook to get information for the communities. So I think that being a little open minded about the different modalities that you can get people engaged, that's useful and helpful. Um, so I just wanted to mention those things, which we have to have things that worked. And I hope that we can uh, resume some of those activities. Thanks, Lupita. I'm just going to jump back in. That that's a great suggestion, and we'll we would be working with um, Leticia Gar Garcia and um, Ana Averas Casas, who are our connectors. Um, they help us shape that those um, those sessions. So I'll, I can bring those up with them too. That'd be great. Perfect. Okay, um, Sarah, then Alex. Okay, uh, so the question was, what are the elements necessary to support the recommendations that you will bring back to us? Um, so I'll start with some, some specifics and it really is based on the earlier comments um, made by John and George and Lupita and my own comments. Um, I think that we need definition and place types that are very clear and distinct from each other so that we really do know uh, what it is that's being proposed um, and how they are different. Um, the granularity of zoning, uh, obviously the devil's in the details with this. And um, there's not much, I mean, there's a, it's a huge packet and you guys have done a ton of work, but there's not a lot of granularity. And I think what we have heard 
today is there's a need for granularity given the risks to um, the industrial nature, the industrial zones, and 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 um, not having this just become the highest, the most expensive um, uh, development that is uh, allowable. You know, it has to be less about what is allowed, but what we is preferred, what is wanted, what is requested, because um, we will get what we regulate for. And if we regulate for something vague, we're gonna get the most expensive option of those vague choices. Um, uh, let's see, um, we need clarity on missing middle housing forms uh, so that, and, and uh, clarity on, on additional areas where missing middle housing is an option. Um, we need um, new, new creative home ownership opportunities as well as creative thinking about where we can utilize some of our existing home ownership opportunities. We, you know, we have deed restrictions and covenants as, as a tool. Uh, and I realize that we're talking at the sort of 30,000 foot level in this plan, but we really need to be clear because this will drive what a, what a applicant brings to planning board. We really need to be clear about where we wanna make sure that there are home ownership opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see real clarity on separation of housing, uh, residential and industrial, and some uh, how you might how you would go about uh, protecting our industrial spaces, their zones. I'd love for there to be a um, if talking about outreach to um, specific communities. I'd like to have I'd like to see the city have a engagement opportunity with artists and or cultural organizations um, to run by them the idea of locating a space, an arts and culture space at the stamp location, as well as what the implications of the proposal might be on, uh, on the artistic community that currently utilizes the East Boulders area um, at, for their livelihood, um, the, the plan as it stands. Um, I, I don't want to just be, you know, the skunk at the party, but, um, you know, the Be Heard Boulder is not a statistically significant uh, survey tool. Um, I think it gives you some insight, but I think we should not pretend that it's something that it is not. Um, and if we're going to do statistically significant surveys, let's do statistically significant surveys. Um, I want to, I really want to make sure that you have done outreach to the neighborhood that lives to the south of the, the proposed um, uh, transit hub. Uh, and, uh, you know, to just uh, leap, uh, to tie on to what Lupita said about using Facebook. I know that uh, Be Heard Boulder posts on Nextdoor, but maybe Nextdoor is a tool that can also be used for um, ongoing input specifically on um, maybe elements of this project since it's, uh, it's such a complex project, Nextdoor is probably a tough tool, but it's, it, you might get some input um, along the same lines as uh, what the kind of input that you would get in a Be Heard Boulder survey, but you would be able to engage more people and let them know that if they are interested in participating in an online event specifically on this project, they can reach out and find out where they are. Because I, I, I mean, Jean, I appreciate you saying that um, you feel that the staff feels that the online engagement has been really successful. I can tell you from the people that I talk to on a regular basis that this, whatever the city's doing might as well be a thousand miles away um, in this past year and a half people don't feel like they access it much. They don't know what's going on. Things are kind of hard. It's not that it's not even, they're not even, it's not about technology. It's just about it's, it's over there versus uh, uh, something that you, sh you go to, <laughs> you know? So um, those are my comments and um, we'll see what you guys bring back to us. Sarah, those are awesome. Um, can I just circle back on a, a couple of little things mm -hmm. um, with that? V very good. Um, we do not have a budget for a statistically valid survey sure. or time. So I just wanted to make that clear to make sure that no one was expecting that. And I think 
You know, I, I totally agree. I think that there are, are a lot of folks that totally struggle with the online um, engagement in the platforms, but we have seen higher numbers than we would have seen in person. Um, and I know that like lots of new faces um, and lots of new people. So it, it's not everyone. I, I totally recognize that, but, but there is some movement. Um, and there are probably some folks that haven't that, you know, so yeah, trade off. So anyway. no, I hear it. I hear you. And Jean, you you have the hardest job, I think, in Boulder. So I um I really appreciate all you do. And you know, the Mark McIntyre's point, a hybrid approach would will be the I think a hybrid approach going forward is the right way to go whenever word is we're allowed to be back in in our seats um in the chambers. But um I still I do think it's still important to make it possible for people to participate um online online. Uh, but um, I'm just passing along that there are lots of folks who are not, there's just something less real about it, you know. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, very good. Sorry. And I didn't mean to. Um... Oh, don't worry. <laughs> okay, um, Sarah, then Alex, and then George. I think. Outreach is one of the city's many strengths, and I've been impressed with a lot of the outreach that's been done so far, especially with the working group. And so if that's any indication of what's to come, I think we're in a pretty good spot. I would like it if some of the engagement that's done to those who have a presence in the study area currently was sort of showcased and highlighted and would hope that this study area is advertised to the community as a whole as a potential more of a destination than it is now perhaps um, so that more people are, are engaged, but a, a mix of, um, yeah, broad engagement citywide, but really highlighting and showcasing some of the feedback you hear from, from those that have a stronger presence in the study area today. Um, and then from the transportation side of things, would I would more confidently support the recommendations if the transportation elements were all summarized on a, on a single map. I think that would help me get a pic, a picture of, uh, of what's being proposed within the public right of way. Great. Okay, thank you. George? Um, thank you. And, and I concur, Jean does have the hardest job in the city. So thank you for everything you do. Um, my team, my team members work awfully. Oh, um, I, I, not to discount everyone else too, because I'm, I'm, I, I know putting us all together and going through all this public feedback and everything that you guys do to try to make these things a success is, uh, is no easy feat. Um, so um, I, I would echo some of um, what Sarah said around um, as it relates to the type of information listening from the public feedback, um, being as granular as possible. I think one of the challenges that I face on uh, sort of echoing the, the difference between in-person and sort of a Be Heard Boulder survey is a survey is sort of a one-way a one dialogue that that person is having with the computer and specific questions. And what happens even in a forum like this that's virtual, that's not in person is people get a deeper understanding by, by everyone's questions. All of a sudden, there are things that are brought to light that you know, someone might not have even thought of. Um, and that it's, oh, it's impossible to frame survey questions to bring to light you know, specific things as, as people have completely different points of view. Um, so that collective, aspect of that in-person meeting with the back and forth dialogue with people like yourselves, uh, I think is critical to the success of a community really understanding and buying into something. Um, and I don't feel like a, an online survey does that. I, I think there's a place, but um, I understand the constraints that you have as well. Um, as it relates to specific things, you know, like, like the use of the term light industrial, um, I think people need to understand that I, that it could include, you know, office. Um, and I, I don't know if, if we use that nomenclature in a survey, um, if people really will understand the granularity and the impact potential for something like that. Um, and it may give us a false positive as to what people may want 
um, if they don't truly understand what that means. Um, and it takes a meeting like this to really understand what that means. Um, similar to um, things around the, the you know, I, I would like to see outreach around the jobs housing imbalance for people to really understand that the project as proposed takes us backwards as it relates to the job housing is imbalance. And I think that should be put forth black and white to the public so they clearly understand what the potential imbalance is of, even though we're gonna get 3,500 units, are we gonna get 15 or 17,000 more jobs? And how does that impact Boulder as it relates to affordability citywide? Um, I think these are critical issues that are not really clear in this plan. And, and I, if the public is not asked those things specifically, they won't be informed enough to give you the answers that you may need in order to um, get this project and accepted and, and the outcome that we may want as a city. So those are my uh, kind of high level comments. Thank you. Great. Thanks, George. Good. Okay. Um, are we to Tila and then Dave? I think that's how the alphabet goes. Okay. And Mark, do, did you, were you finished? Did you get everything said that you need? Me? I, I'm way done. Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't no. hand him the mic again. <laughs> I think maybe John would go after me. Um, so I, I think we have Tila, Dave, and then John. Um, I do not have a whole lot to add um, on top of what has been mentioned. I suppose the one thing that I am wondering is how, how realistic are some of the assumptions about what people want and what the, what the demand is out there for, um, for kinds of spaces. Um, it is concerning uh, right now that you know high tech office use is the highest dollar paying per square foot out there is that going to be true in 20 years i really don't know i think at, like mark mentioned earlier we've learned a lot about this work at home revolution from covid uh, and it's it's a little early to say what what the world is going to look like in 20 years and we're we're always going to get it wrong uh, but one thing that we do know is that you know we've had these evil in commuters for the longest time uh, and proposing developments and, and, and planning um, for mixed use and you know, smaller housing and a bigger range of housing closer to employment centers um, is in theory a great idea. Is, that, is there really a demand for that here? And perhaps because I'm not in the planning space, I don't know a whole lot of background information on that. But uh, to the extent that we've been able to reach out to people who live here now, who work nearby now, who, or who, who live nearby now. Um, and I know that there's been an attempt to talk to local um, employers in that in the East Boulder area. I don't know how successful we've been at reaching the actual evil in commuters to say, if we build this, would you come? And so I, I would just sort of feel better if I had a better understanding that um, these proposals, these changes in land use, these kinds of um, development patterns are actually meeting an unmet need um, that we can demonstrate is an unmet need right now, or you know that there's a desire out there to, to fill these spaces in the way that we expect them to be. Um, I think that there are very good reasons to think that you're right, but if there's a way to, to put some meat on those bones, I would, I would feel more confident in, in supporting this plan. That being said, that's completely separate from my support for the, um, for stamp, for the stamp area. I think if we're, we're planning a transit, um, you know, hub there, we're planning to have bus rapid transit on Arapahoe. We've really got to build out that, that kind of uh, development that I think you have really good um, bones on that on that part, but just in general, the larger sub community plan, I'd, I'd feel more confident if I could understand a little bit more about what people are wanting and what we what the rationale for for thinking that we're right in twenty years that that's what they're going to want. Thank you. All right, and I'll um, <clears throat> just add that um, uh, a lot of great things were said about equity outreach, so I won't say much more except that I will point out that there are good meeting spots in uh, aged community uh, facilities, 
And sometimes those are good places to have in-person meetings. And also Vista Village is adjacent to the site and might be another uh, um, mobile home community to reach out to. Uh, and I'll also say that Ana Casas must be about 18 different people because she's done so much with the city in the last year. And so I want, I want to really commend uh, the, um, the working group for getting people like Ana on. Um, and I want to also point out that the working group is uh, sub how we do subcommittee planning, and that is public outreach. And I, I want to make sure that people don't discount all the public outreach that's happened already. Uh, this is, uh, these are people who really dug deep into this problem. Uh, so that said, I will say it's going to be a challenge to get with a, gen a larger group of the public to understand everything. So I want to commend the idea of using 3D visuals. I think that's a really good idea. Uh, and, uh, and that can really stimulate some great conversations. So I think it's uh, wonderful to go, to go out with the, uh, the, 3D, uh, the 3D representations. Um, I just want to take one issue with um, the point, um, Georgie, on the jobs housing imbalance. If we were to build out to the max development uh, potential for the uh, sites as currently zoned, we would horribly upset the jobs housing imbalance. That's a scenario with the current zoning. So um, we can paint scenarios under which business conditions cause various things to happen, but I don't know if there was an actual acknowledgement by staff or the presenters that this would exacerbate the jobs housing imbalance. It really depends on uh, a lot of the things that still have yet to be set, like the zoning and the stop gaps that might prevent various outcomes. So I think it's a good point to say that we don't want to upset it, but I don't think anybody's admitted that that uh, this land use in it by in and of itself is going to lead us in that direction. So unless somebody wants to correct me, I just want to make that clarification. Great, thanks, Dave. All right, John. You're mute. You're um, need to unmute. Yeah. There we go. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so I I guess I'll. Uh, organize my comments in, in two categories. One is uh, the substance of, of the plan and the other and the other is the uh, public contact procedures that we're being asked about specifically. Um, the, the first, I, I would just like to say that I, I think George and, uh, and Sarah presented it extremely well, some of the issues of concern, and I, I agree with that. And in response to, to David's comment, uh, I think when we, uh, it, it's very important for us to talk about the, the, the ultimate consequences of what a community plan could lead to. Uh, I understand that the present zoning may, uh, may result in, in a certain situation, which should also be discussed because that's an alternative. But when we are doing planning, I think it's very important for us to consider what the consequences of following that plan might be or implementing that plan. And so, so can I just correct that? I didn't say that it was a might be. The statement that was made was it does exacerbate the jobs housing imbalance. And so I was, you, you do, so, um, you know, if you want to say that I'm wrong, go ahead. The, the, but that's, but I wasn't uh, discouraging what could happen, I was talking about what could happen. I was discouraging us from saying that something will happen that we may or may not know. Well, I just, uh, because we're talking about my comment, let me let me clarify. I, I heard specifically from staff, David, that we would get up to 3,500 units and that it would not be a one-to-one -one ratio. In fact, it would be um, potentially double what's there today. In it's in, in the planning exercise. So I was talking about the plan that we were talking about, not necessarily talking about the conditions that exist today, um, but that's a, that's a result, that's a potential result of redevelopment and this plan is it will exacerbate the jobs housing imbalance as presented. You, so if someone you, can correct me if that's you, wrong. Do you agree with that, Kathleen? And yeah, uh, let me um, pull up because I, I do I have heard. the I do have um, the numbers and I, I think that there is some confusion around uh, numbers right now. So I just want to make sure that 
we're all on the same page. Let me see if I can pull that stuff up. Um, to give Kathleen a little bit of time, you relax so you can find it. Because sometimes when you're on the spot, it makes it harder to find the most obvious. So don't feel bad. <laughs> and he makes those statements as well. I think there's a number of us who felt comfortable being concerned about it, David. Um, and that is because uh, I think that when we're trying to do the math and we're asking for the evidence that the math can possibly in a different direction, um, then if we don't get it, we go by the most likely direction of things. And so if I were to put my bet, and I'm not a betting person unless I know I'm winning, I will bet there will be an increase in that gap. And so, yes, based on what we heard today, I have no qualms whatsoever saying that this will make things worse. So I'm using the statistics training that I already have to at least reach something where I can feel comfortable saying. Now, there's uh, the lack of enough information. That's what the other question is all about, trying to find out how did they come out with the project, what criteria uh, were they holding most important? So that the exercises that they came up with is actually what they think is important to go forward. Um, uh, I think Sarah did an excellent job asking and even quoting the report when she found specific evidence that even our own staff is you know, thinking uh, this is not gonna work in this direction. So uh, putting all of these things together, I think some of us are comfortable making some statements where it just shows our concern and that at the very least, I think he has to be respected because that's the reason why we're in the planning board. We have the best interest excuse of- me, um, Excuse me, Lupita, but I am fully respecting everybody's opinion here. I simply want to find out if we're talking about uh, a conjecture of what could happen to Max build out or something that's based on actual models that would predict an outcome, right? Uh, we know that if in today's world, if we were to build out to the maximum development potential for all of those zones, we would have, we would furiously increase the jobs housing imbalance. So does this uh, area plan make, self-community plan make that picture worse or better, right? Because right yeah, now you, so can't, you can't build as much housing. Okay, go ahead. So I did, um, I did find the material that I was looking for. So let me pull this up on the screen. Um, so that we're all looking at the same thing. So um, when we went through that scenario testing phase in the fall, we looked at changing different land uses. And this is where our model came into play. And so the model um, builds projections for um, the number of new homes that could be supported, um, the types of homes and the number of jobs that might be created under these different scenarios. And this assumes under our current land use code, which dictates um, size of, of um, these different spaces, building heights, all of those things were built into the model. So when we did that exercise, we found if we did nothing, if we made no changes to the land use, um, we could only anticipate or expect around 300 um, new homes added. So 600 homes in the area total. And then the number of jobs could potentially double. So that's that double number that I brought up earlier. And I, I think I misspoke when um, the topic came up because what we have done um, with you know the numbers that I provided in our, our presentation about the new housing that could be generated, we went through some calculations to create those numbers, but we don't have enough information to be able to project jobs because of that, um, because we have broken a lot of the rules around um, our zoning code. So there's just not a, a, a button that I can click that would demonstrate the number of jobs. So we have, we have a housing unit count for the proposal. We do not have a jobs count for the proposal. But, you know, if we look at the other scenarios that were created in the fall, 
when we do make some of those mixed use land use changes, we see an increase of um, homes created, not a ton of change in the number of jobs created. Um, you know, little reductions for each of these, but really not a, a significant amount. And, and part of that is, um, you know, I think something that was noted in the market study, um, which described how underutilized a lot of these parcels are today. So I hope that, um, I hope that clears up some confusion that I think I created earlier. So the, I just um, wanted to, I didn't want to necessarily say that this wasn't a concern because certainly economic conditions can push us to a jobs housing imbalance, but I wanna make sure that we understand we cannot draw some sort of hard conclusion that this subcommunity plan has done that yet without uh, some additional data. So is that clear now, John? And uh, you can, I can go back to you now and I'm sorry I interrupted. Uh, John, you're, you're muted, um, but I'll just, I'll say one more comment since it was the comment that we were talking about that I made, which is, I, I do believe that this kind of planning pushes the direction. I mean, the whole purpose of this planning is to develop this area. And so uh, uh, supporting what Lupita said, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's conjecture. I think we're going to accelerate the build out, which is which is fine if that's what we're choosing to do, but we need to acknowledge that what this plan does is accelerates a lot of stuff that could happen here, um, good and bad. And and what by accelerating development here, you are whether or not you're building three thousand five hundred units, you you you, you will it will result it will likely result in increasing the jobs housing imbalance because it's also going to accelerate development of all this additional industrial and office space. And so that, you know, someone else brought up the idea of, you know, walkable neighborhood is great, but it will raise rents and it will bring in development, um, which is, which people just need to understand. So I, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a misstatement to characterize this as, um, th this has an extreme potential to increase the job housing imbalance versus what is there today because we are, we are putting in place a plan that incentivizes development. So if I wasn't clear on that, that's, that's what I meant um, around that. Thank you. If I might add one last thing, just to, so that we're clear, I think that the intention here is really that we are trying to solve very difficult problems. And so some of these things are easy um, and understandable, um, things that will help, and some of the ones are much more complicated. Uh, and, and I just want to make a comment also because one of the things that we're dealing with is this whole issue of the people that are coming in, and I wouldn't call it evil. I, I'm, and this is a little facetious because I know that Tila didn't mean it in a bad way, but I'm saying if people think of what the way I look at these people coming in is, I think is is us not doing not doing a good job as a city to serve these people that come to work here. So as long as we have this imbalance that these people cannot afford to live here, we are failing. I wouldn't call them evil. If anybody's evil here, it's us doing a poor job. That's the way I look at it. So I put it on us, not asking the hard questions or you know, just being a little hard on ourselves to us harder and, uh, and just taking a harder stance on how we're gonna help the city solve this difficult problem. Thank you. John, let's get back to yours. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I had a whole series of brilliant remarks and they're all, all outclassed by this discussion. So anyway, um, so anyway, I just wanted to categorize my remarks in two ways. One is with respect to substance. And that is, uh, I think that there needs to be some, there's a, a couple significant elements that need to be clarified. And one is, the discussion of the entitlements that may be uh, given to developers in order to entice them to do what we want. I, I personally think that it's uh, something we need to think carefully about both in principle and in practice, because if these developers are making so much money, 
the way things are now that they can't even be enticed to do something different without giving them uh, uh, an additional entitlement. I think that's something that we should be talking about explicitly uh, at some point, and the sooner the better. The, the other uh, point I just wanted to make to Kathleen was uh, that uh, you proposed to have three uh, in-person sessions in the in the process in the public uh, process that you described. One with the San Lazaro people, and uh, one or two with the landowners in the area. Well, it seems to me that that may be a, a an inappropriate proportion because, first of all, the landowners and uh, and office owners and developers are those who have been already most involved in the public, in the in the working group, and they are already, I would think, very aware of what's been going on. And in fact, I think that they have had a tremendous influence in the planning activities so far. So, which is not bad. Uh, it's appropriate for them to do that, but I don't think it's appropriate to focus the public meetings. Uh, for their benefit. I think uh, they should be focused more for the to the city at large, because that's the group that has been least active so far in the uh, in the in the public efforts and and they need to be more involved. So that's just my thoughts on that. Thanks, John. Um, I think that we're through everyone. And just to that point, I think we really wanted to make sure that we were focusing on making sure that um, folks that hadn't been involved um, were aware of the project and the recommendations of especially those landowners. Um, did we miss anybody? And is there anything, anything else that folks would like to add on this question? Are we, are we all worn out? I know I'm worn out. <laughs> yeah, we actually um, went a little bit longer than we were supposed to, but um, I guess keeping comments to one to two minutes is kind of hard. Uh, Sarah? I just have a process question. Um, so eventually this will come back to planning board and then the council. When it comes back to planning board, is there some presumption that because it's gone through the process it's gone through that all we have is a thumbs up or a thumbs down opportunity or is there more opportunity for feedback? I'm just a little confused as to what, how this goes. Yeah, so we will bring, um... We will bring the community feedback that we hear and, um the revised uh, subcommunity plan back to planning board. Um, for subcommunity plans, I see Hella is on, so um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but for subcommunity plans, those are adopted by planning board and then um, they require adoption by planning board and um, then would go to city council for adoption as well. Hella? So, so uh Phew. yeah but i just want to make sure so uh, requiring adoption can mean a deep engagement the way we do on any project you know we we're looking for you know what we're, we're trying to get feedback or it can just be either we vote for it or some of us vote for it and some of us don't i'm just uh, is there a is there another hearing experience to come up or where we'll actually again sort of go through some of these issues because what I heard from from our the planning board colleagues was I would be uncomfortable with this until these other things are explored and considered and hopefully addressed so that's what I'm trying to understand is if the next hearing the next hearing is we will be able to look closely at how these issues were considered and addressed or not. Yeah, I think um, I will need to check in with Charles and Jacob about the schedule on that. Right now, we were just planning for um, to come back with those refinements in a complete plan for adoption. But if um, it's needed to have 
uh, uh, another uh, another kind of working session or study session prior to that to go through some of the details. Um, we can look at the schedule and, and try to figure that out. Okay, I think, thank you. It's helpful to understand sort of next steps. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions, John? Yeah, I, I, I would strongly encourage another working session uh, of the type that you described because this is a, a big enough and complicated enough uh, issue that that we need to be able to go through it in detail and satisfy ourselves about it. Great. Uh, anything else we wanted to cover tonight? Uh, we have a debrief on the agenda. Any comments on the meeting? It went long. <laughs> Kira? I was thinking about an hour ago, I, I'm really glad that we're having these joint meetings. Like I, I think it has been really interesting how much input we've had from TAB and from planning board of very different aspects, um, which I think demonstrates something that TAB's been complaining about for a little while is that we're not necessarily very good at, at cross thinking from, from cross perspectives. And so I, I think this has been a very illustrative, I'm hoping planning boards learn some from us. I've definitely learned a lot from you guys. But I think it's really been quite useful to have us all on the same call. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll echo that. And uh, thank you all for, uh, I, I know it, it probably takes a little extra time, but we do learn a lot more. And, uh, and I also want to thank staff, uh, Kathleen and, and uh, the entire team, uh, Jean and, uh, and everyone for, for all this great work. Um, I know how hard this is to, you know, get something this big uh, and get the communities uh, comfortable with it. So thanks for all the hard work you're doing on this and uh, look forward to the next, next iteration. All right. So with that, are we ready to uh, head out? Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks to our consultants, Jay and Mark for hanging. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks yeah. everybody thanks. for us. Sorry, I didn't say all the names, but <laughs> <laughs> no way. Take care. Thank all you, right. everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. All right.